have our panel introduce themselves, ask stars to introduce yourselves, and then you can go right into your presentation. You have up to 15 minutes of presentation time if you need, and then up to 10 minutes of Q&A time if you need. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience today. I'm Ronnie Stein. I'm in the mayor's office. Okay. I'm Margie Davis, and I'm a retired juvenile court employee. Okay. Uh, Adrian Cartlidge with Davidson County Juvenile Detention Center. Anybody in the back? Yeah. I am Latana Wings with Juvenile Court. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, my name is James Bush. I am from Stars You Overcome Drug Abuse. Um, to my right, I have Paris Brown. She is one of our primary counselors at our wonderful facility, as well as we have Cynthia Weststone. She is our chief financial officer. Nice to meet you. All right. So I guess we're going to get into this, right? Yeah. Please. All right. So let's. Um, <coughs> We have a um, youth overcoming drug abuse. We are an adolescent facility servicing intensive outpatient program from ages of 13 to 18 years old. And that's mostly with um, youth that have involved in some type of substance abuse within the Davidson County community. Um, our purpose is to increase resilience, increase attachments to school and communities, as well as increase suspensions, expulsions, and involvement with the juvenile court systems. And so one of those things that we try to highlight on is that we go on those monitors of those peak hours during the afternoon after school when kids mostly are sort of getting into trouble, we like to offer an opportunity for kids to learn about substance abuse, but not just alcohol and drugs, as well as life skills and other things along the way to kind of help them make better choices, to build that reservoir of resilience within them. And that's what one of our main things we try to accomplish through our program. So, next slide, please. Okay. So our target po population is large minorities. Uh, African Americans make up 27% of the Davidson County community, and the probation compared to Caucasians who make up the majority of the population, but only a 30 is 36% of probationers. Now it's no secret that from our program and our numbers, what we've seen, 70%, 70-80% of our program are minorities. And so what we try to do is we try to work with them and meet our clients where they're at. We'll Specific, specific, well, uh, population-specific uh, interventions that will speak to them and help them address their immediate needs or so. Next slide, please. So, these youths are also at risk for substance abuse, drug dependence, according to National uh, Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, children <coughs> offenders, economic disadvantage, living single parent households, substance abuse caregivers, uh, the list goes on and on. When I look at that list right there, I see ACEs, Adolescent Childhood Experiences. And so those are a lot of the young men as well as women that we see on a weekly basis. And what we try to do is we try to offer them opportunities. And it doesn't mean whether, whether you have uh, means to uh, many resources or limited resources. What we try to do with, with Youth Overcoming Drug Abuse, STARS, is to fill in the blanks where they may need that at. And that's our primary focus. So, for instance, um, college connection, working with the Oasis Center, you know, being able to refer kids there, uh, whether it's opportunity now, getting jobs in the summer or so. Those are things and resources that we have on hand on campus. And so by doing that, we give kids opportunities. We give those opportunities that may not have been there otherwise based on their current situation or their current uh, time frame. Next slide, please. So what does the program look like? It's 20 sessions, 20 sessions. Yes, it is. We changed it from 16 to 20 because we felt like we needed a little bit more time with them all together. As well as, uh, again, 13 to 18 years old, those who are suffering from substance abuse and co-occurring disorders. Again, it's not just about alcohol and drugs. We can have a kid that can go in there and just smoke marijuana, or they can go and take Xanax bars or anything like that, but we believe that substance abuse is a symptom of other bigger pressing issues that are going on with the child. So what do we look for? We look for maybe they have some situation with depression. Maybe they have some situations with trauma. What we've noticed as far as with our young ladies is that at one point in time we saw, and we recorded it, it was about maybe 70% of our young ladies who had been sexually assaulted. And so how do we work with that? We are partnered with the Sexual Assault Center, and on a monthly basis, we have someone from that center come and give talks to our young ladies as well as our young men, because you just can't work with one gender specific as well. What we found at that point was that some of our young men had never known what the conversation of consent resembles. They never knew what consent is. It's just like, it's like a, um, no was the beginning of the negotiation. 
So what we try to do is fill in those blanks. Again, like I mentioned in the earlier slides before, is resources, connecting with skilled individuals within those communities that can speak to them on their level so that they will be informed, empowered, and have that reservoir of resilience going forward in their life that they may not have gotten elsewhere. Um, we run four days a week, three hours per day, and gender inclusive groups, young men and young women. And when we say that, is that we separate the guys from the girls. And why? Because it's nothing worse than having somebody trying to hit on each other when you're in treatment. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey baby, come on, it's like, you're supposed to be paying attention now, come on now. Or it's just, it's distracting, it's frustrating. And so we found that to be very successful in maybe the four or five years that we decided to go that direction. Because it used to be a point in time where we had it all together. It didn't work. And even at that point where we had um, recovery groups, oh, was it maybe two years ago, well, a year ago, we had recovery groups, and we just said, I said, okay, we're gonna put them all together. That didn't work, because, man, you got people going back and forth, and it's like, you know what? <laughs> you go over there, you go over there, it works a lot, a lot better. Next slide, please. So, what are our tools? What are our, our weapons, if we can say it like that? I don't wanna say it like that, but anyway. Matrix model. Adolescent community occurring disorders, uh, old from Hazelden, um, evidence-based, uh, reputed uh, sources. Uh, ACRA, Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach, as well as Motivational Interviewing and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Now, some people may ask, why do we have so many? Because we do not believe in a cookie-cutter model. There's not one intervention that's going to be able to work with our population specifically. They come from different diverse backgrounds, and their families come from different diverse backgrounds. And unfortunately, we have to find the um, necessary combination to work with them on their level. Again, we are trying with therapists, meeting our clients where they're at. So so some things as far as when it comes to CBT, we change the thought, we change the action. You know, what are their thoughts? What are some of the things that have seeped into their subconscious that has been fully formed since they've been born as opposed to their, um, their subconscious, I'm sorry, that's been fully formed since they've been born as opposed to their conscious that's not really there till they're maybe 26 years old. We're looking at all those little different things and tools as far as something as simple as uh, ACRA, Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach. Okay, some of our kids are hungry. They haven't had a snack or anything like that. They've been in school or maybe they're on ADHD and they haven't eaten anything. They're all different types of medication uh, regimen and rituals that they have or something like that. So what we're saying is what we need to do is when they first get in there, maybe within like 30 minutes to an hour, we give them a snack, you know, get the glucose running, you know, keep them focused. We've had times when some of them have been denied a snack and <laughs> it's made for a very eventful afternoon. So some things as simple as that, you know, those are the approaches that we're using. Adolescent community, um, uh, adolescent co-occurring disorders. Looking at, you know, working with not just the alcohol and drug only situation or approach, but looking at other things and making it complex. For instance, if they're having educational issues, if they're having financial issues, I mean, for instance, and when I mean financial, as far as like maybe having a job, maybe being able to do something like that. Um, maybe if it's something with their parents or something, referring a resource in that area, or maybe something uh, set the senses of educational wise. Maybe they need to go to tutoring, after school programs, or anything like that. Being on well-rounded from a holistic viewpoint as opposed to we're just saying, we're just gonna work on your substance abuse and then after a while, you're healed, you're clean. Doesn't work like that. Next slide, please. So, our impact. Youth who complete the program will show a reduction in the rate of reoffenses with juvenile court. Youth who complete the program will have increased connection to people, places, and experiences. Youth who complete the program will show an increase in cognitive skills, knowledge related to healthy alternatives. Well, that's all part of our curriculum. You know, based on the different intervention tools that we've had before, that I just showed you in the slide previously, we try to work with not only connecting our kids to the community, but also working with them so that they will be an opportunity for success. They have access to different programs and resources through us that go to other individuals. And because of that, it's going to, we hope, present a snowball effect. What we've seen from our numbers is that as many that do come from us through juvenile court, they don't generally don't go back. You know, and so that's something that we can love to hang our hat on is that as many that do come, generally they are not involved within the juvenile court system within the time frame that we see them, even up to six months. You know, and then sometimes now, granted, 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 there are times when we have to have a little bit more patience. 
with some of our young men and young women. And that's what we're there for. Because it's not just one of those things where we want to be punitive. What we found is that some of the situations that young, some of these young kids have come out of or so, a lot of adults in their life have been punitive. So you are next on the list. If we can find ways to be patient and empathic on suffering with them or so, and give them the opportunity to be and realize who they are. And sometimes we've seen, and I'm gonna show you a picture in a few minutes, it take maybe two years before that happened, where they are stranded in recovery court, limbo, and they continue to come every Thursday. And we're there every Thursday, and we're sitting looking at them, and they looking at us. And so what are we doing? We're trying to get clean. It's like, we're still on the ball. We, are we still going forward? Are we still there? I was like, do we need to have them referred to inpatient? No, let's keep working. Let's keep working. You know? And eventually, we have seen results in that line. We've seen kids who have been in recovery court for a long period of time actually go graduate, get their high school diploma, actually go out there, get jobs, um, get means of transportation, and to be able to do things that they did not do or had the mindset to do when they first entered our program. Next slide, please. So what we also want to do is strengthen youth resistance, increase refusal and decision-making skills, increase school attachment, increase positive orientation to his own future, promote youth involvement in their community. So, I mean, it speaks for itself. I mean, those are some of the things that we're looking as far as with our young men and women and the things that they have going on in their current lives. Connection, you know, being that sometimes the situations they came out of have possibly lent them to a little bit of isolation or maybe a familiar structure that is not all as positive as needs to be. But one of the great things is that when you have someone that has graduated your program, as they're able to come back and say, hey, can I get this? Or can I uh, get a phone number to uh, this resource? Or something simple as, hey, can I come and get a snack? <laughs> you know, because like, it's that connection, it's that rapport, it's that camaraderie that we build with them that shows them that they have someone that is tied into the community that can help them going forward. And, the greatest thing about that is that asking for help, because many of our kids are not taught to ask for help. They just try to go it alone, and unfortunately, they have been hampered in our system because of that. Next slide, please. So, a success story. All right. I had a slide. I didn't want to put it on a picture. I didn't want to put it on the uh, the the thing. But this is a young man. His name is uh, Bay Charles Summers. Now, granted, I don't like calling him Bay. I call him Charles because I'm not calling a young man Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and so this young man I've known for quite a bit of time. He came to us about maybe two years ago, and he started off in regular general probation, and unfortunately, he went to Yoda at that point in time. He was able to complete a program to some degree. Then all of a sudden, nah, he couldn't stay off what he needed to. So what happened? He had to go to recovery court. He was in recovery court for a long period of time. And we continued to work with him. He continued to come to Yoda. He showed promise. Sometimes he had successes. Sometimes he had times when he kind of like head scratchers. It's like, what are you doing, guy? Uh, but what I was able to, it's great to say, is that in the last two months, he was actually able to graduate successfully from recovery court with no substances in his system and everything. And these are over multiple screens. And again, like the zero tolerance screens that you guys give, these are over multiple screens, which was remarkable and was uh, beautiful to me because that showed the progress of a young man two years ago till now. And that's where our program comes into play, is that being able to show that unconditional positive regard and that empathy, but also that congruence. Because there were some times with me, myself, or Ms. Paris, <laughs> we'd be like, what are you doing? You know, and, but again, the camaraderie, the rapport was built between one another where there was a respect level between us and that we could say, okay, we can do better together. What are you needing? And that's what it's about, you know, us being able to serve our young people. So I think that's about it. Any questions? How old is he? Just out of curiosity. He's, he's, just, he's 18. He's 18. He's 18. Just 18. Okay. Yeah. 
two questions. Um, 250 young people, you all estimate, you serve in a, a year? Yes. And then my second question is, um, you're, and I understand because I used to be in the nonprofit world myself, that you're asking for the full $50,000, which one would strategize always. Um, clearly, that's under 20% of the program. So clearly, you all have, have a program going regardless of what happens here. Um, what is the effect of not getting the full 50 on Yoda for the year? We would not be able to serve as many kids if we don't have the full 50. That impacts the number of staff we can have, the number of hours they can work, and then that translates to the number of kids. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. So, and, and piggyback what Cynthia was saying, the, the ability of us being able to do the Community Partnership Fund last year is that we were able to add additional time to being at uh, presence at juvenile court to do assessments or anything like that. And so that's because the thing is, is that we have to have our staff, we have to have people available to uh, be able to service when those assessments come in so that they can get back to probation officers and the list goes on and on. Right. And, and I'm not intimating anything. Obviously, the percentage well under sort of 20 percent of the total program is is absolutely in line with most most um, most kinds of funding so thank you any other questions she has five minutes remaining for questions so since the funding of last year how many additional kids have you guys was able to service before getting that grant last year? Before getting the grant, I mean, and I just alluded to it when it comes to the um, extra time that we're able to serve mm -hmm. at juvenile court, because now we're able to um, put staff where before we were just a Thursday uh, one to three, but now basically we are from maybe nine in the morning to all the way to three in the afternoon at juvenile court when it comes to assessments and actually maybe looking at adding additional time with that. Because of the funding, that kind of increased our about maybe 25% or so. And then just a question. Um, outside of the 20 weeks, like, what is the contact, the frequency of contact with youth outside of that 20-week program? Well, see, the great thing about that is that for some of our um, clients, we advocate for a uh, step-down process okay. where maybe after 20 weeks, they're not clean, unfortunately. And maybe they have some, but you see enough promise in them to say, hey, look, we're going to tear it down. You don't have to come every day, but maybe you come two days out the week, okay. or maybe you come one day out the week. And so what we found is that if we show some type of uh, uh, belief and them, we know that they're there, but it's just that sometimes they have a couple barriers. <clears throat> if we show them that they can do better, then they will do better. Now, there's another conversation that comes along with that too. If they're just blowing up the screen left to right, might need residential treatment. And that is also something that is on the table, and we try to explain that to them. But we always give them the opportunity to be empowered and make the best decision, and where it's like, maybe they don't necessarily like it, but they can respect it. And that's what we're trying to get on board with. But before it actually gets to that point, there are a couple different steps that have happened. So there's an ongoing relationship. Ongoing relationship, yes, sir. retired juvenile court employee. Uh, Jim Schwack, I'm a deputy court administrator at Juvenile Court for Finance and Business Operations. Adrian Cartlidge, director of Juvenile Detention Center. Uh, I'm Eric Ritter. I work as research coordinator at Rafa uh, Institute, and I'm a doctoral student at Vanderbilt. Okay. 
and I am a case coordinator. My name is Ashley Sellers. I'm a case coordinator for the Roth Institute. Jump in. <laughs> All right, so should we simply just go over the, the whole application piece by piece? Tell us what you think we ought to know. Yeah. Okay. You can assume that we have read it, however. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think the most important piece is to underscore that while the restorative community conference between the young person and the person harmed is the cornerstone of the uh, of the of the programming of the Fa Institute, at the same time and simultaneously, we have what we're calling the restorative advocacy track, which is really designed to meet the needs of the youth. Uh, outside of the RCC, outside of the Restorative Community Conference. So while it's obviously important to address the immediate harm that occurred as a consequence of the crime, we know that there's a lot of other harms that are in the background. And often the youth who has committed the harm has him or herself been victimized and in their own right and is recovering from trauma. And that's what the restorative advocacy plan is doing simultaneously as the RCC. So you, if visually you can see in the handout that the restorative advocacy plan happens kind of simultaneously with the actual RCC. They're parallel tracks as you see them. So we almost have like a, the excuse me, the judicial process, which is kind of that top line that says we understand that our youth have committed harm in the community and we really want to look at repairing that. That bottom track, when we have our advocacy, that actually looks at all of the personal growth development of that youth, what trauma they have uh, been exposed to, and really trying to pinpoint what ACEs they may have or what they've been exposed to and being able to eliminate some of those factors. It's great if we can go through the judicial process and get them to kind of take accountability, but if we don't really address some of the things that are happening within their household, if we don't teach them how to deal with trauma or deal with these negative circumstances, then there's the possibility that some of these things could reoccur, right? So we want to create an environment where they can stand up and take accountability, but also since we aren't having um, we ha while we have contact with all of their caregivers and those individuals, if they're at not at a place where they are willing to accept our help, the best chance that we have is for us to prepare our youth with all of the skills necessary and all of the support necessary for them to be able to make better decisions in their community. And sometimes what we actually see is that they're able to actually kind of advocate for their parents or their caregivers in some levels. Um, we've had parents before that have said, um, even like within the instance to a GED, like I had to learn from my child. I was in an age group where my child was and they had to, to help elevate me in these aspects, right? Um, which I just think is an important distinction. Yeah. So um, our, we, were, we used two, three screening tools, two developed by uh, UCLA, which is the post-traumatic stress. Uh, in indicator and then a broader bereavement uh, index that is identifying essentially ACEs. Um, and then we also use a kind of standard criminogenic risk score um, simultaneously with those. And the idea is to then also develop post-tests so we can measure change in those key areas. Should we just keep talking for 15 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, so again, part of that advocacy piece is that while the program judicially may have a certain length of time that we would look at whether they have completed the goals, whether that stays with us or whether that would go back to the court, we want to look at them at a post six months to see if there have been any. Um, reoccurrences of criminal activity of that sort. Actually, the plan is 6, 12, and 18 months. Yeah. But along that track, 
if we are able to, to have an advocate build a type of relationship with this youth where they can call and say, like my family's struggling for finances, I've had the thought of doing this particular thing. How can I how can I better feed my family or how can I do these things? Then that advocate is there to also provide that emotional support to say, like, I'm really glad that you called me. I'm glad that we have this relationship that you know that somebody is there for you in a positive aspect that can help guide you and direct you in um, in these really positive transformative ways. We also have some partnerships with some local businesses that are willing to help us set up employment, um, which, you know, when I, well, a lot of times, you know, I am, I am a case quarter, so I probably have a lot more dealings with our youth hands-on than the majority of the people at Rafa. And when we talk to our kids and I say, like, you know, what's really happening? And it's, I've got 10 brothers and sisters, and my mom's working three jobs. We don't really see our parent. I don't know how to feed my family, so I've started doing this really dumb thing, right? But it's in that structure of survival and not just for themselves but for their family so if we can help advocate them in a way where they can have gainful employment which is going to build self-esteem which is going to build like all of these positive characteristics for them to be productive citizens when we want to look at our neighbors that's who we want to see we don't want to see a youth who is that we believe is continued to be involved in kind of these sketchy things but we want to see someone who is willing to really better themselves and help their community um, yeah. Let me just ask a question. Yes, okay, sir. okay. You're asking for the fifty thousand dollars to uh, hire a mental health professional. Yes, ma'am. Now, how do you uh, envision that that person working with the clientele, as far as administering the assessments and doing the therapeutic plans? I mean, this is one person that you're looking for to to do all of this. Mm -hmm. So, when we, if you'll see on the chart, how we have the enrollment meeting. The, line, the red line's coming directly off of that. Okay. Okay. So we'll have the enrollment meeting. At that point, we would have someone that would help uh, um, really give all of those assessments. And one, one of the things that we've also realized is that the assessments have to be relational. Our children are extremely smart. If I come into a room and I say, fill this out, how many times have you been molested? The kids are like, no, you're trying to pull me away from my family. Like, they immediately know kind of outcomes of that. But if you sit down and you have conversation and it's expressed to them that this is really about your betterment and we're not trying to punish we're trying to help support we're tr you know what if there are tools in your household that we need then we can really use this to address that then the youth is much more forthcoming in saying like I'm gonna be honest with you and tell you what my needs are because the tools are not necessarily successful as tools they are successful in relationship yeah and I think one of the um, one of the most common misperceptions about restorative justice generally is that it's about purely reconciliation between the person harmed and the youth. And that is not the national model, not the evidence-based model of restorative justice that we're using. It's about meeting both parties' needs. And if in part of the way in which you identify your needs and the way that the person who's been harmed has a sense of justice and is vindicated is through that conference. <coughs> But the conference itself is a way, a way, a larger way of meeting both parties' needs. It's not the end in itself. So along those lines, to build on what uh, Ashley was saying, the, the, the main role of the clinical therapist will be to professionally administer the UCLA post-traumatic stress disorder index and the UCLA persistent complex bereavement disorder checklist. These are things that Travis and I and Ashley have been discussing. We've consulted with other people, folks at Vanderbilt that these are the best tools available. And we don't have the expertise to administer them. And not only administer them, but actually also to begin therapy with the youth, if that's needed, to begin counseling. Our JDP is still, you haven't finished the first year yet, have you, in terms of? We took our first case July 1st, 2000. So close. And your your numbers here, you're 26, it says you're working on now, and your goal for next year is 25. So this position would allow to better serve those you're serving. It doesn't necessarily build more capacity yet. Correct. And then um, we're sort of mingling time here, if that's all right with you, yes. as to make, make it flow better. The total funding right now is your contract with juvenile court? 
No, we don't currently get any funds from juvenile court. Our, yeah, we don't currently have, yeah. We actually have, um, Rafa is actually the only institution in the nation who has received funding from VOCA. Restorative as, justice. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, as a restorative justice entity. Um, be victims of crime in the, the federal agency. They recognize that we are victim-based. And obviously you have some private funding um, as well. First Tennessee. First Tennessee right. Foundation. Mm -hmm. With the big kickoff. And Impact Justice in Oakland uh, has also helped with funding and also with training. And their specialty is really on the youth side of things. Do you have a sense approximately of what sort of that total annual budget is? I'm just trying to figure out what kind of, what percentage of that budget the 50000 would be. I have some sense, but I don't want to guess. I think the best thing would be to, for us to talk to Travis and just get that info really quick. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Yes, our main sources of funding, again, to sum up, are VOCA, Impact Justice, First Tennessee Foundation. So coming up on you guys, um, First year, um, can you share like any success stories? Success. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have we've had our first conference, in which the young man came in the room, immediately went to the person harmed, extended his hand, shook his hand. Um, it was extremely thoughtful in all of all of his wording. Um, you know, we've had some of those circle conversations. I think the majority of individuals may be familiar at the table where we are. We come in a circle format. There's a talking piece. You're only permitted to speak if you're the one that has a talking piece. Um, in an environment where we have said, like, you don't really have to talk. If you don't have anything to say, you're able to talk that piece. We had a youth that would stop and, like, hold it and really, really reflect on everything that everyone had said. Um, to the point where when his mother spoke without the talking piece, he immediately tried handing it to her. <laughs> so he was more engaged in what the rules were than, you know, the kind of the parents in that setting. Um, but at the end of that conference, our young person and our person harm hugged and um, actually have plans outside of court process to do things together to the point where our person harmed actually wants to come on as a volunteer with us. Yeah. Hmm. It's a space where you can take accountability without the, 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 the pressure and the you know, harm done. Yeah. And another thing I'll say is that the, that's a success story for someone that had went through the entire program. I, I feel like we have genuinely had successes, even if there have been circumstances in which we had to send a case back. We have had persons harm that came and said, I'm okay with this because I feel like someone actually listened to me and someone spent some time with me and I feel like I've developed new friends from having this process. So even though, for whatever reason, not fault-based, the youth wasn't able to participate, um, the person who was harmed felt a great sense of relief, relief for just having conversation with us. Suppose we, uh, if we have, I think, a total of uh, 11 applicants uh, this year for the, for the for the funding last this last year and what's uh, the applicants that are currently funded this current fiscal year we ended up we, we funded four uh, applicants each at fifty thousand um, dollars so we have and I think we have a total of uh, we have fewer last year than we have a total of seven so uh, this year we have more applicants same pot of money. Um, so I know something that the panel have to discuss is how we're going to uh, allocate that. You know, but the way that, of course, you, you've asked for, you've been very clear in what you were seeking the, the, the 50000 for. Um, my question is, if we ended up in, 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 in making these awards, end up doing something less than that, is that going to... Uh, even be something that it's going to be beneficial to you, or if we can't, or if we can't fund the full fifty thousand, is that going to keep you from being able to do what you're asking to do? My sense is yes, because um, the therapist probably, clinical therapist probably, for the first year or two, would probably be a contractual basis, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
if that's the case, um, then I think absolutely less than 50,000 would still go a ways towards integrating that aspect into our program. Is that what you were going to say too? Well, I mean, ideally, I would think that, um, of course, we would like to have someone present as much as possible sure. to address the needs of our youth. Sure, that's um, good understand. But at the same point, we want to address the needs of our youth as much as we can. Right. And if there are limited funds to be able to do that, then we would just do the best that we can to be able to, to service them. There's one piece of this I just wanted to add, which is that, and I think this was important in the initial setting up of the program as well, that the plan is to really evaluate with a control and experimental group the success of this program based off of kids with the same demographics that have come, gone through the traditional juvenile court right. process and to really assess what the long-term effects of the, of the program are. Is it too preliminary yet to see how that's playing out. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, I, but I would add, there's been, um, we're looking at trying to create some changes to the MOU so that we can have better access to some of our youth. Um, and there was actually a conversation recently between um, the court administrator and the police department in saying, where the police department reached out and said, if I know that if this youth had been able to stay with restorative justice, that this these further offenses wouldn't have happened. Right. But it was one of those situations where we hadn't even been able to make contact with the youth. So therefore, they weren't. They, while they had been accepted into the program, they hadn't had any contact with us. They didn't even know they were part of the program, and something else happened, and, and they were sent back. Um, whereas, if there's a difference in looking at a youth who has had engagement with us, and then them doing something and going back, um, as opposed to someone who doesn't even know this is a process, or that anyone cares, or is willing to to have um, to look at all of their needs and hear their voice. answer any other questions about restorative justice in general or it's a terrific thing you all you and the court have started something wonderful for young people how do you how do you address the critics i know i know they're out there I mean, <laughs> part of, you know even the staff trying even in juvenile court where you know we had folks who were very familiar <laughs> You know, with, with restorative justice, with restorative justice circles, with the evidence behind, you know, behind this. Um, but even with that, even within the context of our, you know, staff, there are people who um, they haven't heard of it, and their initial reaction is is negative. Yeah. You know, how do you? And I, so I'm sure you've encountered that, you know, other places, other times, other folks. How do you how do you address it? How do you handle that? I think there are several um, aspects of that. One of the aspects is really just becoming more community involved. We're really, really, really early. Yeah. And so a lot of the community doesn't have access to that. But in the past two weeks, I know that there have been at least three media sources with regards to restorative justice. Um, I've had conversations with Lipscomb University and, and all of their kind of board and, and what restorative justice looks like. And, and those individuals standing up and saying, I didn't know we were treating our youth this way. I didn't know there was a better option. I didn't know that that's how it was defined. And then those individuals who are all voters go out, have other conversation in their community and continue to, to have that scale out. Um, the week before last, we had kind of a think tank with predominant leaders in our community. And um, all of them left with, you know, great hopes of what was to come and continue to spread that word. Also, I think we have youth that are willing, to, that are going to want to come forward and say how this stuff has impacted them. And once we have the availability for them to come forward with their voice, for right. people to see that change, because that's where I think a lot of our stereotypes come in is we see stuff on TV that has this negative connotation and we don't really see our youth. We don't see the things they're going through or the accomplishments that they make. So just for their voice to be heard, um, we'll, we'll definitely break down some of those barriers. But in the meantime, it's just us as a community saying, yeah, this is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. I can see these changes that are happening. Right. And, and one, one thing I would just add is, I think another big myth about restorative justice is that it is just easier than the traditional court process on the person who is responsible. And I think um, to actually come to grips with the harm and to do that in a genuine way is extremely difficult. Right. 
and requires transformative change. For anybody that's had contact with our youth, if you ask them how their day is, you're going to get that one word response good. How's this good? How's this good? Like, that's the only thing they want to say. So when you're talking about a youth coming and facing someone that they have harmed and saying, let me tell you exactly what I did, and being open to that, like, that is, that's kind of shattering to see them sit there and talk for 10 minutes. Sure. You know, especially in an emotional state. We've got kids that are crying, and when you're talking about strong black um, youth, being able to come to the table and say, and share emotion, that's, that's not something that we, currently we facilitate right. in other aspects. And I know it may be hard to capture this, but how much time are you guys spending with each youth? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> like if you just had to guess the man. Um, like, so this last week I spent, um, we've, got, we've got one case that has um, three youth involved. They sat with us from 9 a.m. until noon, Monday mo- last Monday morning. Uh, I, we went and saw another youth. I think we saw a total of like six youth Monday, um, it, like all day, like every day. It is just that kind of thing. We have, like, I don't, I couldn't even tell you. And it's, and even, and I think one of the reasons that I misjudge that personally, and that's probably something that I need to um, really offer myself some critique on, is that I've got youth that will text me at night and say like. You know, I had a hard day today. And so in that relation aspect of me as a case coordinator, I don't always think to document that in the notes and say, this youth did this to me, because then it's more it's more relationally, and they just reached out to me. One of the things we, we recognized even early on is that um, it, it requires more meetings than we thought in order to get both parties, the person harmed and the youth, at the stage where they're willing to participate in the OCC. Mm-hmm. So we ended up already, like, I don't know, within the first three or four cases, realizing there was already a pattern established where we need to spend a lot of time with the youth before they're even ready to say, okay, I want to be in the room with the person who's involved in the case. I don't know, it's just a, it's obviously not an answer to your question, but. It's a good explanation. Mm-hmm. Four minutes left. Do we need Thank to? You. Do you want us to text Travis and give you that information? Yeah, sure. I think it would be very helpful okay. for how us. We, how should we give, get it to you? Um, Shelly, can they send a, a memo to you that answers our question? Our question to them, my question to them was, what is their, their total annual budget and what percentage is the 50 of that total? Can they send that to you to, and you get that to us? Later? Yes. Sure. We're happy to send anything to you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and so just closing, I would just really like to, um, again, say that so much of the entire process is relational. If we've got a youth that doesn't trust us or isn't able to say, these are my needs, then we're not able to to assist them. And this therapy advocacy, restorative advocacy piece is really helping us develop um, specific needs that they would, for us to be able to address so that we can just really prepare them for um, positive transformation. Closing statements? I think the addition of the clinical therapist would be, in addition to all the work that we're already doing in terms of you know, playing basketball, hanging out, encouraging conversations, the, a trained therapist on staff would be an enormous asset. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Thank you for being here. Sitting on the Gentlemen and Not Gangsters program. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. You are welcome to introduce yourselves, and we're in session now. I'm Ronnie Stein from the Mayor's Office. Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. I'm uh, Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator for finance and business operations at Juvenile Court. Adrian Carter, director of Juvenile Detention. You can jump in. <laughs> I'm Bishop Marcus Campbell, the uh, founder and CEO of Gentlemen and Not Gangsters. I'm Kelly Gray. I am a supervisor of the gang unit, high risk unit at Juvenile Court. 
and I'm Jacqueline Favors. I am uh, mostly attending because I work at the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance and we um, help Bishop Campbell with the, we work on faith and health and Bishop Campbell is um, one of our uh, uh, groups and congregations that we work with. So. Let me know when you're ready to move your PowerPoint forward, please. I'm ready. Here the mission and vision of GANG is uh, just to lead by example, making sure that we are very positive role models in the community, uh, making sure that our vision is, is explained to the young men to teach them how to make better choices that we develop to encourage, inspire, and motivate through the unconditional love of God. Gang was started in 2008 uh, on the response of a community need that I saw uh, with the juveniles at the time, get, uh, getting into gang activity, uh, getting into more criminal activity, and then I had to go back to my childhood experience of a teenager putting myself in their shoes. I didn't have anybody to talk to, nobody that I could uh, trust to even share what I was going through. And uh, I felt like the kids needed somewhere to go dealing with somebody that's been there and done that uh, just like they have. So that's where game came from, to where we can restore hope back into the community, as well as uh, our partnership and marriage that we have with Juvenile Court uh, since 2015. That, that date is only for the grip court, but we've been partnering with them since 2008. Yeah, they've been instrumental in the um, what was now the GRIP that we have at Juvenile Court, which is the Gang Resistance Intervention Program. So it's the only program of this type that's in the country that um, that only gang-involved youth are in this program. So we've partnered with gang because we actually, we can show them the structure of what's going on if they don't stop making the bad choices that they're making. But we actually have not walked into, in their shoes like these young men have. So gang, hence, has and um, have used their experiences and their trauma as a child to help us um, in this relationship. The values of gang is very important that we express the unity in the community with the juveniles that we deal with, considering that they are all our gang members. Uh, we create an atmosphere that's neutral. We do not let them throw up gang signs in there. Uh, we do not let them wear colors. We have neutral colors when we have their folders that they work out of to, treat, uh, to teach them unity. Who better to be able to uh, rely on each other than people that's been going through the same thing? So we teach them a sense of community that they can be there for each other even after they finish the uh, gang program. Our service is that we be committed to serving each other, making sure that everybody, the journeyman as well as myself, the secretary, that we're all sold out and all put into the process of making sure that we make a difference in these young men's lives. Because we have a slogan where we say if we can change your mind, we can change your grind. And so we're all sold out on that and making sure that we serve them in the best capacity that we can. The leadership part, part is that we uh, serve as examples to others, to everything we do, demonstrating the heart of service, and also creating leadership within our juveniles that we service. Uh, we have a summer program at the church, which I started uh, about eight years ago. We serve <coughs> 236 kids from kindergarten to ninth grade, and whenever our class falls during the summertime, we take some of the guys from the gang program and let them be leadership counselors over the summer camp and that's a great wonderful experience for them to give back but also see what it's like to be a positive figure in somebody else's life. Uh, the excellence uh, we're committed to nothing but excellence. We, we will not take nothing less for we feel like that if you put your mind and heart to it you can be whatever you put your mind and heart to. So we strive for excellence even with our service with them. Every After every class we always have a meeting me and the journeyman as well as uh, the juvenile court uh, to make sure that we can do better than what we've done the last class. Uh, the teamwork, we all work as a collaborative team together to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can, uh, that we're following the vision, goals that we have for the program, and that the juveniles are getting all that they can from us. And, and I want to point out on the teamwork part how important that is, just to show that solid solidified front between the probation officers and the journeymen, to know that we're there, like, as a family, we're there to wrap around support for these young men. So if we showed a solid front for them and working together, it kind of like lead by example type deal.
our goal is for us to reduce juvenile delinquency, reduce their gang participation, improve the academic performance as well as the graduation rate, not only from our gang program, but also from high school, and to improve their family relationships uh, with their parents. A lot of the kids has a disconnect in home, so we want to make sure while they're there with us, not only do they get the service that they need from us for them to be better, but we want their home life better too. Because we feel like we're working against the grain if we're doing something with them, but home is still bad, then it defeats the whole purpose. And one of the main goals for the juvenile court part of it through gang is the is creating opportunities. What we want you to understand is these young men have not had opportunities such as myself or maybe any other sitting at this table. So we have to think outside the box and this program is designed exactly for that to create the opportunities these for these young men that otherwise would not know what is different from a way of, of life on the streets which is all they've known their entire life. These kids aces are off the charts. They're the highest of the highest that we deal with. So if we don't meet them where they only know what is going on and try to change that or, or, or open up their eyes or give them a different vision or different opportunities, then they're never going to know anything different than what they've been raised in and what they, you know, basically think is the only atmosphere that they're good enough for. We try to change that mindset and that's through the opportunities that we try to create, that the journeymen try to create through gang. Organizational capacity consists of the program director, which right now is me, uh, the officers, which are the president and vice president that will fill in whenever I can't make meetings or we're trying to make partnerships in other counties to make sure we can spread the program out to service more youth than just here in um, Davidson County. Uh, the secretary, which is my wife, she corresponds with juvenile court uh, through email or whatever they need to keep up with the attendance of the young men that come there making sure their parents are doing their part. Uh, the chief facilitator is the one that uh, trains all the new journeymen and makes sure that they comply with our standards on what we need them to do when they come in and try to mentor the young men that's a part of the program. And our academic facilitator is the one that facilitate our 12-week gang class uh, where we have a C curriculum. We talk about classification, currency change, competition, uh, conflict and interest, community, uh, uh, we deal with trauma, we deal with a whole lot for that 12 weeks and that academic facilitator is over each class. The journeymen that we have, we don't like to call them mentors for we believe that we're taking a journey with the child. Most programs only go as long as you in my program, but we go even further than just the program. We want to make sure we keep a relationship with them after the program because it's very vital that they see somebody that they can trust but that's been consistent consistent in their lives. The journeyman has a caseload with uh, two or three kids apiece. Uh, we feel like that's better for them to be able to build a relationship with them, that if they only can deal with two or three kids, they can make sure that they make home visits, school visits, court visits, uh, anything that they need better than them trying to handle 10 or 15 kids by themselves, they could be able to deal with three a little bit better. And I just want to point out the part where he said consistency. Um, one thing that we like to point out is these kids have never had anything consistent in their lives life. Their home is not consistent. Their neighborhood is not consistent. The school they go to is not consistent. So we try to keep the consistency um, between the probation officer and the journeyman so that they understand that this is truly something that they can trust and depend on to help them through this. Who facilitates the journeyman? Do you, Bishop, or does the juvenile court? Uh, the gang program. Yes, sir. And also, every journeyman that's a part of it, we all have been uh, ex-offenders where we have been locked up uh, for criminal activity and uh, about three or four of us are ex-gang members. So I experience uh, our lifestyle, what we've been through, what we know. The kids automatically relate to us when they come in the program and some of us know us from our street credibility.
The trauma-informed care approach is something that, uh, thank you, Ms. Jack and them for taking us through the uh, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, when we first started out in 2008 dealing with the juveniles, we would get upset with them on how their attitude is, not understanding the trauma part of it. But once we finished that ACEs training, it opened up a whole new world of how we can service them without, you know, uh, getting mad at them because of how they are. And uh, matter of fact, going through the training showed me all the trauma that I had with the experience of my father uh, 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 beating my mother and being very abusive to her. So um, it opened up a whole new world to where we can understand the social context, where we're familiar with the local community and culture of the gangs. All of us know about the gangs in Nashville, where they, you know, pretty much located at. Uh, we, we understand what it's like to have trauma experience, watch our friends get shot in front of us. We know what it is to be molested, uh, to be vi verbally abused, as well as physically abused. We know what it, what it is to be going through gentrification, poverty, lack of education, lack of opportunity. So um, our social context with the young men is based upon our experience and what we know. They, uh, we identify with the youth, with the program staff and journeymen, which all have shared experiences, like I said earlier, and a positive youth development approach engages the youth within their community and enhances their innate strength and promotes positive outcomes. We try to bring the best out of the child. Even when they feel like they can't make it, can't make it is not a word when it comes to us in the gang program. We all know you can do it. You might not can do what I can do, but you got something to bring to the piece of the pie or to the puzzle. Uh, we use the best practices. We include the uh, Office of Juvenile Justice Department, Delinquency Prevention, Comprehensive Gang Model. We partner with other community-based organizations and former gang-involved individuals. People come in um, that have just got out of the pen. We have gang members that come in and talk to them that uh, have been highly involved in gang activity. The trauma doctors from Vanderbilt come in to tell them about their experience when they have to wheel them in there with gun holes in them. The funeral director comes in and talk about what he sees as the family is grieving because they have uh, passed and don't have insurance. And then uh, also we provide opportunities to decrease the impact of ACEs. Our target population is kids between the ages of 12 and 18. Um, through the group court, we only deal with gang member juveniles that are on probation. Uh, the group court, as we partner and marry to them, we are the first tier of that probationary period with group court. So they have to get out, get through our program first, that first phase, in order to make it to the sixth phase, second phase, to be able to get out for probation. Um, they all have uh, felony charges, gang involvement. Uh, Pri primarily uh, minority youth facing poverty, food insecurity, lack of economic opportunity through ACEs. They're in the promise zone of Nashville neighborhoods. Uh, gang will service probably about 60 youth during this grant period. Uh, the benefits to the program is that we remain in the community, rather that they remain in the community rather than in custody, experience forming positive relationship with mentors, gain skills and education to turn away from illegal activity. We want them to be positive pillars in the community as we had stated in our mission statement. And I just want to point out, the youth that they're working with, these are the these are the young men and women that literally their entire life have had the door slammed in their face. Whether it be through other services in the community because they're considered too high risk so the providers or therapists don't want to go into the home, whether it's been a target on their back at school, whether they can't even find their niche in school because they've been kicked out or expelled. So these are a group of kids that literally their entire life have had the door slammed in their face. So now this is just an opportunity for doors to open. The program design is that we start off with orientation. While well, we partner with uh, the grip court, we all have orientation at the same time at the church where the gang program is located. Uh, our orientation consists of us bringing a casket in. My wife make name tags for every child that's coming into that session. We put it in the casket along with a mirror and we call them up individually one by one. And when they look in there and see their own face and get ready to pull their name tag out, we stop them and say, tonight you are making a decision 
decision and a choice to say you're not going to wind up in this casket. And it, 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 it really shows a positive effect on them because when they come in, they act like they really don't want to be there, but they're very scared, you know, after that. We have our weekly group sessions again with the C curriculum that we uh, teach. Um, our weekly mentoring, we do uh, court visits, school visits. We take them on college tours. TSU have been very generous with us, uh, letting them come and uh, tour the college, which have been a positive impact. Most of these kids come in during orientation. Their only goal is to live to C21, but because of the college tour, we've actually had some of the young men go to college as well as join the military. Uh, the community service opportunities are incorporated throughout our program. We have the education services where we can uh, get tutors to come in and help them with homework. Uh, the criminal justice uh, uh, intervention involves collaboration between case managers and juvenile court where Kelly and them will send a referral sheet to us with the names of the kids, where they live, their parents' name, phone number, what school they go to, how old they are, as well as what gang they're affiliated in. That gives us an opportunity to know how we can best serve them. And they also have the after school and some activities where, again, they volunteer to help us be able to be leaders to other kids. This is our proposed budget, the program director uh, for travel expenses, uh, material to be able to go out and share about the gang program and also make momentum and, and spread it out just like, again, as far as from Davidson County, uh, 16,000. Uh, we have the stipend uh, for the journeymen for their gas and their time. Uh, a lot of these brothers work. They have to uh, take off from their job to make school visits and everything because, uh, again, we also do some things in uh, Metro, but I'll talk about about that on the next slide. Um, we got down travel expense whenever we take the kids on um, um, field trips, as well as getting them into basketball games and other things. And after every graduation, we buy every child a suit, mm -hmm. tie, shirt, and a belt, because we want to see the transformation from when they first come in, and we really want them to become gentlemen and not gangsters. And then you have the other non-personal, uh, which coming from uh, uh, street works that we have partnered with, which is our fiscal agent. And the data integrity is uh, measurable outcomes, is gang graduation rate, uh, making sure that there's a positive, improving relationship with the parents and God and uh, the presence of a supportive relationship with gathering and analyzing stuff, uh, tracking them through their enrollment uh, when they first started, the class participation, how their attitude is, uh, if they're late when they come, making sure that the parents are also vested in their kid, because if they're not vested like we are again, we, you know, it's like we're cutting against the grain, so we want to make sure that they're also <coughs> signing their kids in, making sure that they complete our homework because we have homework that they take home with them on different discussions that we have. Like sometimes we want to know how much do you love your mother and we want you to write it down. When they come back the next time, we'll say, well, if you love your mother that much, why she got to always deal with you being in trouble, taking you to court, coming to see you in detention? That's not love. You're taking out of her day and her schedule to go and do some stuff that she didn't even, a crime for that she hadn't even committed. Um, we also have the SPEP program Again, Vanderbilt Mahari Alliance is helping us uh, to track down more evidence so we can become more evidence-based, which we have got a lot of momentum in that, and I really commend them on what they're doing to help. But we look for positive behavior in school, home, as well as with juvenile court. Last but not least, our collaboration and sustainability is so important for us that we continue our marriage that we have with the grip court because we're very invested with juvenile court. Uh, every third Monday, we also go into the detention and we talk to the young men in there. Some of them that we talk to, we might see them come through the gang program. Some of them might be real, real uh, offenders that came through our gang program but got in trouble. So we're talking to them like what happened between then and now. Uh, we we have a collaboration with the mayor's office uh, where they're very supportive of what we're doing. The Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance Faith and Health Collaborative, uh, Greater Harvest Church of God in Christ support the food. We try to uh, supply food for the kids. MDHA, again, we're going to the property, James Casey, uh, Andrew Jackson Cheatham, um, uh, Dodge
Dodge City, which they call Cumberland View, uh, with their mentoring kids. Some of the kids in our program live in those areas, so it's like they're getting a double dose of us being in their life. Uh, the Pastors Partnership, which is I'm a part of, also with Juvenile Court, where we also have kids coming in that's not through going through grip, but they come in with other things going on with them that I personally go take care of uh, with the family. Uh, Centerstone comes in to help us with the mental health piece because that's very important. Street Works, again, is our fiscal agent. We have sustainable impact on individual youth, preparing to develop data collection to measure long-term impact, continue developing community partnerships, and grow fundraising capacity along with the marketing strategy and standardized program evaluation protocol. You have four minutes remaining for Q&A. Bishop, let me, help me understand the total budget for gang. You're asking for 50 from us, and on here, you're showing another 47 that are coming from your side with in-kind, and I assume some money you've raised. Is the total gang budget this $100,000, basically, you showed total? I'm just wondering how you, you're clearly doing a lot of this work right now without this grant. Yes. So I, help me understand your total budget. The budget that we're doing now without the grant has been me and my wife missing light bills, car note, and rent to make sure that we're vested in the program. I always felt like that if I wait on money, all these kids would be lost. So we done whatever we could, beg, borrow, whatever we had to do to make sure we had the money to do what we needed to do for the program. So every dime on there, it, it will go because we have maybe about three sessions to four sessions out of the year, and each session cost us at least about $12,500 to go and uh, do what we need to do effectively, as well as me trying to take care of my journeyman. Again, we would have better capacity if they had more compensation to do more work with the kids. So we're compensating them, compensating myself for travel time and everything, as well as the material that we have, as well as being able to take them to games. And we would love to do a stipend with the kids because I believe a lot of these kids are hungry and they don't have money at home, and a lot of times they're getting in trouble trying to provide for the family to help mama. But what would, what would it be like for each child to show up on time every week and you give them 50 to $75 for being there? That's something to show them that you got some good earnest money. I really mean what I say, and I'm trusting in you to do the right thing. I'm, my questions are trying to help you build your case a little bit here. Okay. How many young people do you estimate you're currently working with? Currently, we got 10 in our class, but we also go up to about 25 kids. So this money from this, from the CPF fund, you would almost double the number of young people you would work with? Yes. Because you're estimating 60 under this? Yes. Okay. Um, and then my related question is, um, because I know about the work that you and the others were doing with the Center for Nonprofit Men, is part of that work you were doing discussing how to add additional private sustainability to what you're doing. Well, clearly, what I'm, what I'm asking you is, this fund exists right now. $200,000 in it, there are $500,000 worth from 11 total applicants. So clearly, everybody is not going to get what they want. So one of the key features here is, hopefully, organizations have the ability on their own to find other sources for time. Um, and that's a complicated question, so let me back up to it. What can you do if you get less than the 50? Less than the 50, still do what we've been doing before we got to 50. Uh, we also, since we went through the uh, nonprofit program at CNM, they've been teaching us how to market it and uh, uh, build capacity from private donors, which we're working on a benefit program to also to try to help raise money for the gang program, because we know that the grant is only going to be for so much, but we still got a whole year that we got to service kids. And again, it's not only just juvenile court, we're doing a lot of work in the community period. Including statements, Tom? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take up everybody else's time. I apologize. <laughs> no. no, great question. Including statements with Rich Tom? Anything y'all want to sum up with? No. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is harder than preaching on Sunday. <laughs> 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 Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. 
I'm uh, Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator for finance and business operations in juvenile court. Adrian Carl is director of the uh, Ailes County Juvenile Detention Center. Right. I'm Art Fuller. I'm the founder and president of Knowledge Academy. Raymond Williams, Knowledge Academy. You want to just jump right in? Oh, okay. No, I mean, okay. Yeah, no, no uh, so thank you again for having us here this morning. And uh, we're just going to go through the presentation here, uh, talk a little bit about our program and how it relates uh, to uh, youth violence prevention and the work that we have ongoing. First slide we have here, and the thing that we focus on at Knowledge Academies is we really are a team. We are made up actually of a number of different community partners, and so they are listed here, but it's all focused on one goal of leading a successful life. So at the end of the day, the work and the, the partners and everything that we're trying to bring in, that's our particular goal. And so the founding organization is, of course, Knowledge Academy Incorporated. Um, and then this year, we've been doing a lot of work in workforce development and training. And so Empower the Journey is basically the umbrella, the name that we use to signify two things. Number one, it's open up to everybody. Who are we empowering? Empowering everyone in the community. So all of the workforce development and training activities and things that we have going on are underneath that particular umbrella, Empower the Journey, which is just a project based at Knowledge Academies. Um, and then every day on site, we actually uh, currently actually have a behavior integrated health team. It's one of actually the few in the city. We have four uh, kind of like full-time graduate students that are on campus every single day, in addition to being supervised by licensed educational psychologists. So every month, our 180 Red partner, they usually do somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 actual individual sessions with students every single month. Our current population is about 900 students. About 70% of our population is on free or reduced price lunch. Uh, so the partnerships that we actually describe in our proposal, they are actually ongoing and they're actually a part of our community and our school. Then I'll have uh, Raymond Williams kind of talk a little bit about uh, EJO Ventures and I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, EJO Ventures is a, um, is a, a entity that's out of from uh, the Nashville Airport. They have five or seven, five or six, seven different uh, airports that they have and they actually is a minority business as well and they was recognized as a national uh, minority business for the airport. And so what they do, they actually is a company and then what they, they also train we're also doing CompTIA training with them as well. And so a lot of, say, some of the, the students or people that come through the programs, they also have internships, things like that, that they have, and they can walk through and kind of give them that real-life business opportunity from that perspective. Yeah, and so we actually just recently secured a five-year relationship with the Metro Action Commission focused on CompTIA and technology training with EJO Ventures as our technology partner. So we do work with them on an ongoing basis. Uh, the Village United Methodist Church, in our application, we actually describe our outdoor learning program. It has actually been recognized nationally and locally. Um, and so we're actually working with the Village United Methodist Church. They've actually allowed us access to their land to actually grow fresh produce and things like that. Give you a little bit of history about our outdoor learning program. For the last two years, we've actually grown 4,000 pumpkins each year for the last two years, and we've actually showed them to organizations such as Cheekwood, YMCA, uh, this Nashville Zoo. So it's a way that we're, it's actually giving students that hands-on experience of how do you take produce uh, to market. Uh, we actually also have a uh, partnership with Go Build Tennessee, which is focused on construction. So actually on our campus site, we're in the process of doing a renovation where it's going to be a construction and training center actually on site on our campus. And again, it's available to all, and it's underneath that umbrella of Empower the Journey. Um, and then the, the last two, uh, the Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network, uh, we're partnering with them on just raising awareness about uh, teen suicide and just suicide in general. And then uh, a 
of course, we just had uh, partnerships with the juvenile justice. So our network and our partnership uh, is broad, it's ongoing, but all of it is focused on that one mission of leading a successful life. So everything that we do, we're really trying to focus around those particular areas. Uh, next slide. And as I uh, described before, so all the programs actually that we have that we're requesting funding for, none of these are startup programs. So these are programs that are ongoing and they are, so it's not like we're trying to start up or create a new program to help support uh, this particular venture. Um, um, and the nice thing about it is that they actually connect to activities, infrastructure, and programming that's occurring through our regular school year as well. So they're like nice extensions of what we already have ongoing. Um, as, you, as I'm sure you know, 37013 is one of the fastest growing zip codes in the state of Tennessee. We're located right in the heart of that. There's lots of development going on around us. They're putting in a new exit just uh, to accommodate a lot of businesses and things moving to that particular area. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about each of those programs that are listed there. And um, the thing that I'll begin with is we, we've been working as a team and we really have a great team of experienced professionals that are used to working with our student population to actually implementing these programs and that that's just actually ongoing. So the first one I'll talk about is the STEM and technology. And as I mentioned before, that's starting with EJO Ventures, recognized as the 2017 Small Minority Business of the Year by the Nashville Airport. And as I described, uh, we actually have a partnership with them. Where we're actually gonna be doing technology training as part of a five-year award that we received with the Metro Action Commission. So that STEM and technology connection is already there and it would be adapted to continue or extended to include uh, potentially if a positive decision is granted to this particular program. Great thing about it, it's given students those hands-on, high-demand technology skills. Um, and so uh, we're really excited about that particular partnership digital audio and media. We actually have on our school campus a full-fledged digital audio and production studio, and so that includes the ability to kind of record uh, digital audio as we're recording here now, produce, and all of those kind of different things. And our students are uh, used to kind of getting the expertise needed to really apply those types of things to the real world. Uh, everyone uh, today is plugged into social media in some way, somehow. This digital audio production studio actually provides a real connection to that in terms of producing different videos and things like that. Uh, the print marketing and design, uh, we have a copy center on site where we can actually produce, and I should have brought this somewhere, we actually are able to produce basically, you know, full-fledged magazines and things like that. And uh, the copier industry is a high demand, and so that is a service area where we're actually trained students on how to be successful in that particular uh, type of industry. And uh, we're actually able to save businesses actually about 20% on whatever, like if you go to FedEx or whatever, we can basically produce the exact same thing at a 20% less cost, the exact same function, exact same quality and everything. Uh, but again, it's connecting to the real world. Uh, the outdoor learning and wellness I talked about and gave you the example, last two years we've grown over 4,000 pumpkins. Uh, this was actually started by an initial grant uh, from the MacArthur Foundation about two years ago, and it's just continued to build momentum and steam. Um, so there's a lot of support around getting students used to being in the outdoors and making those outdoor learning and real world connections. And then the behavior, health, and well-being I really think is kind of like the value add that we bring. Having 180 red on our campus every single day, it really makes a tremendous difference. It, it gives us the ability uh, to kind of intervene and interact uh, when different unexpected situations arise where we need to talk and get counseling and all those kind of different things to students. And again, that's just building on a two-year relationship that we've had with 180 red. And so the majority of the budget, when you look at it, I would say probably about half of it is actually associated 
associated with services that are uh, related to behavioral health, mental health, and well-being. And it's done in both individual one-on-one -on -one sessions and also small group sessions. The purpose of that is just to kind of reinforce the type of support uh, that can go with that particular area. Um, so that's kind of an overview of our experience. Then to the next slide, I'll let Raymond talk about this. So yeah, so we're gonna talk about the soft skills and uh, so what we've known or seen here in reference to dealing with not only uh, children, but young adults and adults as well in reference to the soft skills, the lack of. And from my understanding from my uh, uh, profession is, 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 is uh, personality assessment and understanding those small soft skills, those Entity, those things like that, that's their need to not only continue to grow as a person, you know, as a person, individual, but in the workplace as, as families as well. So those soft skills, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, etiquette in reference to whether it be phone, email, you know, knowing how to talk to someone. Also with the, uh, uh, with the uh, workforce development piece and how those skills are transferable from not like say in-house and personal, but also from the work side. Um, so that's kind of what we do there. And it covers uh, uh, several different things in reference to conflict resolution. Uh, also talks about, you know, dress for success, things like that, those soft skills that's definitely needed across it. So that's a lot of things that we do and kind of help that holistic approach to the kids that's involved. And again, with that particular program, we actually started piloting that two years ago. And so this is, this is actually going kind of like into our third year of doing this kind of soft skills training with the students and things like that. We started a pilot with our actual high school students that were selected to do internship. They actually went through the professional economics class that uh, Raymond gives. We invite in guest speakers and things like that. So again, I want to emphasize these are things that have been ongoing and they're basically extensions of the current uh, program. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the next two, um, the teamwork and diversity. So uh, we've been around for seven years and we live in Antioch. So if you're in Antioch, of course, you know, you just have to embrace diversity. That's the reason that we're there. We, we love that and we love the diversity that's there. We have Spanish, Arabic uh, speaking staff, translator, all those things. That's what we deal with every single day. And so uh, within the soft skills training, it's also important to include that diversity and that cultural component as well. On the financial literacy front, so one particular uh, cornerstone of our kind of curriculum support is that financial literacy piece. So that when you do get out in the workforce, uh, how well are you used to creating a budget, following that budget, and all those kind of different things. So actually for the last four months, uh, we've been working with the uh, author of The Millionaire Choice. His name is Tony uh, Bradshaw. He's actually the author of it. And so every single participant, um, you can purchase The Millionaire Choice as an actual book. We actually have a curriculum around it that is specifically designed uh, for uh, kind of teenagers and those going into the workforce. And the thing that I like about the financial literacy program, it's character based because what it's basically saying is, hey, the character qualities that you have inside, that's really what the reflection of your financial habits and things are. So the book actually begins by focusing on those key things like, uh, you know, follow through, respect, setting a schedule, and how those different things impact your financial literacy. So the, the reason we really love this book and actually are using it with our students is it begins with the character inside first. And that's what the millionaire choice is about, is really look at yourself, what are the qualities that you have inside. Um, and then the last part, which is the healthy eating and wellness. So on our campus, uh, which is 140,000 square feet, we actually have what used to uh, be a, a restaurant <laughs> at the end of the day. So uh, this fall, we're actually uh, creating a culinary program. And so we started the launch and leading up to this in January. So we actually have the ability for the participants that have an interest in the culinary program and programming. We're actually working 
work with two uh, award-winning chefs. Uh, they're Surf Safe certified, so they would have the ability to actually certify uh, students that have that particular interest in the culinary field. Um, and just to kind of give them, they are actually going to be uh, at the farmers market this Thursday and Friday. Um, it's uh, Nash Top Chef, and we'll be there Thursday and Friday, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. People can come by and kind of get a little experience with that. Um, and then our supportive success, and this is gets back to we're always ready to adapt. So whatever you're looking uh, there on paper, that's the plan. And then so what happens when you start implementing the plan, you've got to be, be, be prepared to adapt, adjust, and update it. And one of the particular things with our uh, population, like I said, the relationship that we have with 180 grid, we really do rely on that. They really have helped us in adapting to the different unexpected situations and things that arrive and provide that immediate counseling and support to students and even families and things like that that are in need. Um, and then going to the uh, next slide, at the end of the day, we really are trying to make these career connections and I'll let uh, Raymond talk about that. Understanding meeting each individual where they are, right? And that's a key into getting them from this place to the next. We're great at creating the vision, right? A lot of times the people in these situations are underprivileged or underdeserved uh, people, situations they can't, they can't see two years, a year, five years down the road. So our best thing is we're able to create that vision for them, right? And so give them a pathway from this six months to a year, you know, by giving them support as well. Like I said, we're about the holistic approach of each person. Uh, putting some some basic skills inside of them, and so no matter where they're going or what they do, they're going to be okay with those basic soft skills, those basic um, mental approach, you know, to certain things. So that's kind of where we are with that. And so all the partnerships we actually have listed up here, these are formal partnerships. Partnership with the Nashville Software School actually begins in May. That actually gives them a career pathway to, you know, those high wage, high demand careers that's ongoing. Uh, Go Build Tennessee is the uh, kind of promoting career awareness and construction. No matter what degree that you're attaining, there are career opportunities in there for you. So create that vision. The uh, Citizen's Kitchen is connected to our culinary program that I mentioned to you about in the ServeSafe uh, certification. And then last uh, but not least, uh, we're actually finalizing a partnership with the Tennessee Department of Labor that actually is going to begin in April related to our workforce development and training programs. The first two programs that we're actually starting off with, uh, we're starting off with construction. And then, uh, as I mentioned to you before, about technology in the high demand areas and things like that as well. Um, and then, so we're kind of back where we started. We really are a cohesive team. We really are focused on trying to provide that robust support of what leads to a successful life. And the programs that we're proposing are basically extensions to the work that we already have ongoing. And I think that is the conclusion. We have seven minutes for Q&A. Yeah. You, uh, you state in your application uh, projected number of clients that would benefit from your services, a total of 40 at risk youth ages 12 to 17. Uh, and do you envision, tell me what you, are these uh, youth that you're maintaining that you would otherwise not be served? Without oh, I get what this, this funding, I mean, is this, this yes. the funding, is this going to increase your capacity? It then? does. So the request for funding basically allows us the capacity to increase the amount of services that we're delivering to these 40 students. Because, okay. uh, uh, like, as we're... Uh, ending the school year, it allows us to kind of continue to provide those services and support throughout the summer, leading into the fall, and so on and so forth. Okay. It really, um, really intensifies the amount of support for those students as well. We have $500,000 in requests from 11 organizations and $200,000 to give out. What uh, is, the, if you don't get the full 50, um, what can be done? Is it still meaningful? 
um, to what you're doing. Yes, yeah, so every single dollar is meaningful. I'll say that all. <laughs> all like head of the school. <laughs> yeah, every single dollar counts and matters. So what we've presented to you before is this would be our vision. Um, and so any other funding which would be maybe uh, different than that, we would adapt. We would adapt and kind of come back, okay, based on this potential funding level, here m might be some areas that would be updated or changed and those different types of things. I, I have a clarification. Yes. Kind of <clears throat> following with Mr. Swagnax. So the 40 kids would be kids that you typically wouldn't serve? That is correct. Okay. So, yes, okay. yes. And so we've been, so. The, and where this comes into play, so like you'll notice that a lot of our workforce development programs, they're extending to the broader community. Okay. Okay. So the whole purpose of this is really to bring, yes, that's correct. Yeah. And just to follow with that, by the partnership with the juvenile that we're in the process of doing, have a lot of those kids coming on campus. And so that's another avenue for those kids to walk into these programs. So but you would only take 10 referrals from juvenile court? Is that that's what we have in the that's application. What you have that, that yes, application. that's correct. And will those kids be outside of the 37013? So yes. they would be based on the juvenile, you know, yeah. whatever guys, juvenile. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I'll emphasize the goal of this is really to extend and uh, the umbrella. Okay. Yes. To serve. Yes. Babies. Yes. Yes. Because right now, the bulk of your students are in that 3701. That's correct. Oh, that is correct. Because you're a child. Yeah. Five minutes remaining. Um, just out of curiosity, with the, the great work you all seem to be doing and want to do around workforce development, um, do you all collaborate at all with the Opportunity Now initiative? Yes, so we've had a, we've had a couple meetings uh, with Opportunity Now, and I think it's something we need to continue to kind of work through. Yeah, but we, we have had conversations and discussions. Well, yeah, I would urge you to because you know they've got now 350 employers yes. on their portal, and um, um, they'll be at about 2,500 young people in paid summer internships. Yeah, that's summer. that's awesome. So, that is awesome. I would encourage you to do that. All right. One more question. So the youth outside of that, that area code, yes. will they be tr transported in and out? And so the, be the beauty of our uh, Department of Labor relationship that we're going to announce okay. is we actually are get, uh, securing resources that help overcome some of those transportation barriers and things like that. So if they need a bus pass and all those kind of different things. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, well, again, um, we, we appreciate the opportunity. I, well, the thing that I want you to remember is that supporting a successful life. That really is what we're all about. And hopefully you've seen through our application that in order to do that, you have to have lots of different kind of coordinated strategies. So hopefully everything that you're seeing in the application, you can see, number one, these are not new programs, they're extensions of what we're already offering, but they're coordinated and they're diverse enough so that if we really can find a way to meet int uh, the interests of students that may have a lot of different areas and things that they're interested in. So we just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Question, I'll let you do your introduction. Welcome. I'm Ronnie Stein. I'm from the mayor's office. I'm Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator of juvenile court. Adrian Carl is director of juvenile detention center. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Tell well, us about Be About Change. For sure. Well, thank you everybody for this opportunity. My name is Marcel Hernandez. I'm the founder and executive director of Be About Change. This is Woody Murray. He is our vice president. He's uh, been on our board for a couple years now. And wanted to thank you for the opportunity to present about Project LEAD. Uh, so LEAD stands for Lead, Empower, Assess, and Discover. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, but we work with you. Lead, Empower, mm -hmm. Assess, 
Yeah, this, thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I couldn't read. No problem. And as we move on, uh, we'll get a little bit more in depth about that as well as project lead components and the different ways in which we have impacted youth and the different ways in which we intend to continue impacting youth here in the Nashville area. Um, this first slide, I call it being about change. This is me and some friends in fifth grade. And um, that's Robert E. Lee, where I went to elementary school uh, in inner city Dallas. And the reason I put this up here is because two of my friends, the one in the black and white striped shirt kneeling down, Eddie Vargas, and the one on the far right, Sebastian Pinales, we lost both of them over the years. Uh, Eddie was in high school, and we were the same age, so we were both in high school. We lost him then, I was about 16. Um, I basically was told by my girlfriend at the time, uh, hey, Eddie was killed last night on the day of a, uh, a football game. And he was shot in his back five times in his house. He was ambushed. Um, Sebastian, we were 21, 22. Uh, he was stabbed multiple times. They burned his body, threw him in a river, Trinity River in Dallas. Uh, I point that out because we all grew up together, inner city, and some common factors that I found um, was involvement in crime, violence, things like drugs, gangs, those sorts of things. And I didn't know it at the time, but of course I know now looking back, that Be About Change was really born around that time. I obviously realized that looking back. Um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight them and say that they are some of the reasons why we do the work that we do, because we find that some of those common points, such as living in poverty, single parent households, all the different uh, adverse childhood experiences that you see common uh, in our youth these days um, are one thing that remains prevalent. Um, so moving on to the next one, we look at the fact that, especially here in Nashville, inner city Nashville, approximately 75% of Nashville youth live in poverty. I'm sure you already know uh, some of these statistics, but just to highlight that a little bit. So uh, that, that was actually a stat from the community needs evaluation. I believe that was 2017. Um, that remains the case uh, current day. Of course, some schools have um, lower, some schools have higher. And as you know, this affects everything from graduation rates to um, attendance to um, any number of things that can affect things that ultimately lead to the propensity for youth violence. Um, further, when we looked at the Metro Police Department crime comp stats reports uh, in the juvenile section, those started, I believe, oh, right around 2010, 2011, where it would have had its own section. Um, we found that since 2014, youth arrests had actually decreased by about 25%. Um, I highlight that because that is a, um, a data point that may not be so common, especially with the coverage of the different youth crimes that we see today. Um, to differentiate that a little bit, we do see that youth victimization is up. In fact, um, at the end of, I believe it was 2017, we discovered that uh, crime like homicide, um, youths have been victimized uh, by at least 200%. Looking further down uh, at violent crime, there was a recent interview with Judge Callaway and I believe uh, Glenn Funk, where they talked about youth crime and kind of the high profile case with the gentleman that was murdered about a mile away from Hadley Park. Um, Judge Calloway highlighted the fact that these youth offenders seem to be getting younger and younger, as young as 12 and 13 years old. Um, in addition, there's been a spike in violent crime despite the, um, the lowering or the, the lower percentage of youth arrests over time. So I wanted to kind of point that out a little bit um, just to show that um, these things, although overall seem a little bit further down than five years ago or so, uh, they remain to be a, a a primary and, and really significant concern uh, for people like you all and people like me and other members of the community. Um, now, for, as far as the project lead components, um, Mr. Murray will, will give you a little bit about the basics and then we'll kind of break them down a little bit more uh, to get more in depth uh, so that maybe you can uh, uh, figure whatever questions that you may have. Yeah, that'd, uh, that'd be about change through this project lead. We simply want to help youth make positive life decisions despite their current situations. And as uh, Marcel mentioned, the acrostic lead, the, the L is for lead, but every youth should gain the confidence to be a leader when necessary. And empower the E there. Each one needs to feel empowered to accomplish whatever goals he or she wants to accomplish. 
and assess the A, it's crucial that youth understand how to recognize and assess their current situations in order to change those circumstances that they find themselves in. And then the deeper discover, uh, young people can all discover positive ways to finding success in life. So that's, that's a little bit about the acrostic part of it. The components, the comprehensive workshops, uh, we offer eight weeks in a safe learning environment away from the negative influences they may be accustomed to with mentors who have been in the same shoes that they're in. Uh, right now we're completing a leadership program for males ages 14 to 18 that were referred primarily by the juvenile court and these are two hour classes that happen one time a week. Uh, the graduation ceremony for this current participating youth group will take place Saturday, March 30th, the end of this month. Uh, the single workshops, uh, these take place monthly and there's up to 24 classes happening at the juvenile court. The single workshops began in 2017, uh, but just at one time a month and at the end of 2018, the need became greater and so we uh, increased it to two times a month for the students referred by the court. Uh, the scholarships, a higher education scholarship is what we're planning with up to a $1,000 grant for a student that completes the Be About Change court-sponsored program. We'll talk a little more about the scholarships too. The comprehensive workshops, as Mr. Murray discussed, we're currently going to begin week seven of eight uh, in our eight-week program, uh, similar theme to Project LEAD. Uh, the referrals are primarily from the juvenile court. We only have one referral that's outside of the court. Uh, they go for eight weeks. Um, the way that the program is structured now, the first hour is age-appropriate physical training. And basically what that means is that we focus on body weight training. We don't introduce any additional apparatus like bands or weights or anything else like that, uh, simply because the, the, training could, the training need could be a little great for that. Uh, and also it obviously reduces liability and the potential for injury. So we focus strictly on things like running, calisthenics, uh, and a little bit of yoga uh, to, so that the student can hopefully gain an understanding of the relationship between the body and the mind. Um, as you all may know, uh, through physical training, goal setting, those sorts of things, they can be quantitative such that over time one can realize one's uh, progression. Uh, whether it's a particular number of reps or a particular distance in running or whatever the particular goal may be and how that ultimately translates into everyday life. Uh, so the physical training is one component. We also have classroom discussion. So everything from uh, basic psychology so that the, the youth can gain an understanding of their adolescent mind um, as well as discussion about what, uh, whatever issues they may be facing uh, either personally in school in their community, in their home, uh, providing a safe environment so that they feel comfortable to do that. This particular workshop is for males only. Uh, and the reason we did that in part is because uh, I myself am in recovery. I've been recovered for almost five years, uh, coming up on October 24. And we find that in these types of environments, it's uh, paramount for males to align with males for mentorship and females with females. Um, however, this particular program, uh, we can extend it either co-ed or however the need may arise for females only or males only. Um, so that's one, one aspect of that. Guest speakers come in. Uh, so for example, in the application you might note uh, James Floyd, who's also known as Jefferson's Jefferson Street Poet. Um, so he uh, has actually been my mentor since late 2003. Uh, so he recently did a writing workshop in addition to his guest speaking uh, engagement early on in the workshop. And he's got uh, quite a, quite a uh, let's say, um, extensive background. Um, so having come from an environment uh, right up the street, basically, from Hadley Park, where we do our current workshop, uh, facing the challenges of crime, drug use, and the different uh, other challenges that may be uh, present uh, in a community that is impoverished. He talks about his struggles, ways that he overcame them, and ways to ultimately uh, prevail and the need for continued work. So that's one example of a guest speaker that we have. And finally, goal setting is one aspect that we continually drive home, whether it's through our weekly writing assignments or through um, following up with students and parents. So for example, I met with a parent and her two sons just this past week at, at Hadley Park uh, because we had a, a bit of a, a misunderstanding at the previous workshop. And so uh, I find that it's helpful to engage with parents uh, because they're the ones that spend the most time with them outside of school uh, in their home environment. The single workshops, um, those, as Mr. Murray uh, stated, started in 2017, around February timeframe. 
uh, we went in and we met with the star team at the juvenile court, and they uh, eventually invited us after, um, let's call it an audition, after they came to, to watch me speak at a local high school uh, to begin these workshops at the juvenile court. Now, those are more of a condensed version of the eight-week programs that we offer. We only, unfortunately, get to see them that one time. Uh, so it's a one time, and then they're, they're finished with that aspect of that programming. So we spent an hour and a half with them, and oftentimes we discuss uh, leadership components, uh, anger management, how to deal with anger, uh, and different social and emotional learning components, whether it's um, talking about something that's important to them at their particular school. Youth violence comes up a lot, gun violence, um, sometimes they express the need or the desire for um, uh, being more active in the area of gun control, firearms legislation, and the interesting part about that is that that enables us to kind of take a back seat uh, so that we don't necessarily impart our political beliefs, but we more so give them a platform so that they can elevate their voices around the solutions of these different types of things. Um, open discussion is another component. We find that that lends itself more to uh, the smaller class groups. So, if, for example, if we have a group such as this size, then we can sit around a table like this and have more of a kind of a boardroom discussion and then uh, give them an opportunity to talk perhaps a little bit more freely than they might in a larger class. The scholarships, we offer uh, three higher education scholarships each year. And uh, I know Mr. Murray was going to share a little bit about those, and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Lucky Price. Yeah, um, we began this, the three scholarships in 2017. Three more were awarded in 2018. And this month, we're receiving uh, applications right now for high school seniors uh, with uh, financial issues uh, for this year, the 2019 scholarships. Now, at Be About Change, we've seen how these scholarships can make a real difference in someone's life, um, who, particularly those experiencing financial hardships. And uh, that's why we'd like to offer a similar kind of scholarship to a student that has completed the Be About Change uh, court program. Uh, Lucky Price, who's pictured up there, on the, uh, is, is a prime example of a student whose scholarship made a major impact. She attended Pearl Cone High School here, and I regularly meet with uh, Pearl Cone leadership and other community partners to find ways to better address their students' financial, emotional, and physical needs, which are quite a few. Uh, but Marcel can tell you a little bit more about Lucky because he's dealt directly with her. Uh, Lucky is interesting because when we have the scholarship contest, we ask the students to write about either a personal challenge they've overcome uh, and or an organization here locally in Nashville that either inspires them or that they look to for either resources or that make a difference here in the Nashville community. She chose to write about Girls, Inc. Uh, you may have heard about that through the YWCA. And she found that she was really empowered by an organization like that, that, um, like we discussed earlier, helped to elevate her voice around community solutions and recognized her where she was specifically in her life, rather than approaching the student with uh, lecturing or uh, you should do this, you should do that. Uh, so she wrote about that. And after she won our contest, uh, she ultimately went to Belmont University, where she's a sophomore, I believe now, uh, studying music. And she reaches out to me quite frequently to help us with fundraisers, whether it's a local car wash. Uh, we live in Bellevue, so she came out to Bellevue to help us with that. She also helped us with a, an or a, a fundraiser in Antioch, uh, where we had kind of like a student uh, celebration uh, to celebrate graduation. And then she also does some social media for us, as well as help to uh, basically be a general advocate for Be About Change and the different, whether it's initiative, fundraiser, or effort that we have going on. She's very vocal uh, and social, and so that helps uh, in terms of uh, getting somebody who is um, kind of peers with other students uh, to spread the word on, with other students on how to get involved. Uh, finally, she uh, has come to our juvenile court workshops. She has led two so far, one with a co-presenter with one of our board members, Claire Burke. Uh, and basically, she talks about ways that she overcame struggles. And we find that the students oftentimes, as you all may know, uh, will listen to their peers before um, parents, so to speak. I know that was the case for me when I was growing up. But um, so she uh, is working on a curriculum uh, to expand uh, our juvenile court programming. And she uh, works hand in hand with myself and with other board members. So that's a little bit about Lucky Price. She definitely embodies what it means to be about change. And of course, the big question that everyone has is, what's the budget? And uh, it's no. Um, it's not by accident that we arrived at 4999 on uh, the stipulation to be uh, 
uh, at that amount uh, requires an audit otherwise if it goes above that amount. As a small organization, and as I'm sure you all are aware, um, even if it's just a basic gap um, type of audit, uh, it is very pricey. And so we know that we can continue to make an impact, whether it's 5,000 or 50,000. And so you'll notice uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So our scholarships, each year we award the $1,000 scholarship. So um, right off the top of the, at the, at the um, first line item, you'll see the $1,000 for the scholarship. That's positioned for a graduate from one of the Be About Change programs as referred by the juvenile court specifically for this uh, project lead program. Insurance uh, is, is pretty straightforward also. So we currently are under a separate grant. So if you double that amount, uh, that's what the insurance is annually that facilitates our ability to conduct these types of workshops. And so that would be a shared cost, not just an outright upfront cost. Personnel training, you'll notice it's, it's uh, the heaviest point on there. Uh, we feel that it's important to highlight this because the people that have been through these uh, different stages in life that Mr. Murray highlighted are basically the ones that the, the, uh, the students will be able to learn from uh, because they can relate to them. So when a person talks about growing up in poverty or growing up in recovery or growing up uh, in different types of environments, uh, they find that they mirror that. And oftentimes, again, as you all know, when we share our scar tissue uh, with others, that the goal is that, that these uh, young minds don't have to create fresh wounds to kind of recreate uh, where we've been through. Um, and finally, uh, of course, supplies. Uh, those are just um, like one-off type items. For example, uh, every week I go to Kroger and buy recovery snacks and recovery drinks uh, to uh, distribute to our students following the physical fitness portion. Um, so that's the budget in a nutshell there. And as you all know, otherwise you wouldn't be on this panel, uh, restorative practices work. So one point that we found, uh, I specifically spoke with uh, Court Administrator Kathy Sinback in discussing uh, the efficacy of these types of programs. And one data point that was shared with us was the fact that in 2016, when they first started kind of measuring the progress of these types of programs, um, they took kind of the standard two-year study period, and they found that in 2016, of the youth referred to these types of intervention programs, by 2018, only 6.8% uh, had re-entered the court system formally. Um, so you're looking at a 93, 94% success rate, so to speak, uh, in, in, the, in terms of um, students not having to return into the court system. And so these restorative practices work. Uh, we know that sometimes punitive works, uh, in particular whether it's heinous crimes or particular age groups, but we're finding uh, as time goes on that there's more at play uh, than just trying to treat a human being like an animal and throwing them in a cage, locking them up, throwing away the key. So ultimately, it's the fact that we meet youth where they are, we determine it's not, kind of like the ACES talks about, you know, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. And we discuss things like historical trauma, epigenetics, and the different factors that affect a particular mindset uh, and the way that a youth ultimately may uh, choose to act. Ultimately, we try to uh, make them aware of that by being mirrors ourselves so that hopefully they can see uh, their strengths uh, in a profound way. And so finally, we ask that you support Project LEAD uh, by awarding us this grant and to give us a chance to continue our work uh, in the juvenile court through the eight-week workshops, through the single monthly workshops, and through the higher education scholarship. Five minutes for discussion. Okay, so all your funding has been coming from fundraisers? Some fundraisers, help? some private donations, and currently we have one grant. Approximately how much is that, is your budget now? Right now it's about 6000 annually. Uh, I just did the paperwork to submit to the state and to the 990N, and it was like 8200 and some okay. change uh, for 2018. I'm a total layperson, so let me pardon the ignorance of this question. I understand how the comprehensive workshops can have an impact. Mm -hmm. What is the impact of the single experience a young person in juvenile court will have in one in your in one of your single workshops? For sure, uh, and that that varies. Um, so, 
Ideally, when we have a smaller group, the impact is potentially larger. Um, we have up to 30 students for each workshop. Uh, we used to have 40 or 50, and so we conducted them a little bit differently. But in terms of impact, what we do is we follow up with the students, um, and we, we try to do so intentionally by securing their email address. Uh, and then we have relationships with uh, court probation officers and other officers, such as MSAC and Metro PD. And ultimately, we try to make sure that whether, whatever the, the underlying charge is not something that's repeated. Uh, and so whether we find a lot of truancy, for example, uh, is common in those types of workshops. Some involve uh, drug charges, some involve um, uh, grand theft. Uh, but we ensure, or we try to ensure, uh, that they're not repeating this behavior. And ultimately, at the end of every workshop, I invite students to come back and participate in leading a particular workshop. Now, I personally incentivize that uh, by offering them um, money to compensate them, uh, not through the nonprofit, but myself personally. I say, hey, for anybody that's interested, uh, I will pay you $100 to come back and lead a workshop. And one particular co-presenter usually doubles that offer, and so we try to incentivize that a little bit. Uh, in terms of impact, um, it's, it's not realized until looking back, as you may know, uh, because we can't determine that you know within a week or two. Uh, but with the stats, such as the 6.8%, we know that because we are one of the four organizations that work directly with the juvenile court, uh, we know that we're making an impact at the very least uh, within uh, some range of that percentage. Thank you. How does this, if you're awarded this $5,000, how much does it expect? expand your capacity to do what you're doing? So currently we have the one uh, eight-week program, and we want to program through the $5,000 at least three additional programs. And, and when I say additional, that's in addition to ideally it, we just submitted our uh, renewal for this current grant that we have. So that's an addition to that one, and that one is expanding as well. Um, so through that, we have at least three eight-week programs, and those will have up to 20 students each. So we're looking at a total of 60 students um, at least um, overall over the course of those three eight-week uh, workshops. And then to continue and expand the 24, I say 24 because they're twice a month, uh, so there may not be uh, two in December, for example, uh, but up to 24 workshops so that we can actually staff those uh, a little bit more intentionally uh, with um, with uh, like certified and trained personnel. Um, now, I, I do the, the, at the beginning of the month personally, I do that on a volunteer basis. Uh, so basically I do 12 a year, let's say. Um, I would like to ultimately expand it to have other people come in so that the youth aren't necessarily just seeing the same face. Um, it, I think it helps uh, to, to get kind of a varied perspective uh, from different, different people, different uh, professionals. Thank you. So one minute call. Are your scholarships thousand dollars one time, or does a recipient repeat while they're in school? Right. They're currently one time, uh, so the the goal is to help them gain access to higher education, um, and at their discretion, they can apply at one thousand to the fall semester or half and half. Or if it's a particular vocational school, we actually haven't had that yet. But if it's a vocational school that may not be on fall spring semesters, then however they want to apply that at that time. We currently have applied for another grant. Uh, that would help us make them renewable and larger in quantity as well as um, size or scope uh, of the particular scholarship. Uh, but just to differentiate, this particular $1,000 scholarship would be solely for a graduate of the uh, juvenile court referred project. Oh, so your scholarship, other scholarships now are not specifically for right. someone coming out. Of right. So they're for Nashville area students. We with, recently with financial needs. And right. We recently invited Cheatham County uh, in addition to Davidson County, but that's just because. We live in Bellevue, like I said, uh, so that was a natural expansion. But uh, for this particular one, it's geared for juvenile court students. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Hi, I'm Ronnie Stein. I'm representing the mayor's office. I'm Margie Davis, a retired juvenile court employee. I'm uh, Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator at juvenile court. Adrian Carly, Davis County Juvenile Detention Center. Okay. Good. Hello. I was about to say good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> I am Terika Sampson. I work in the Center for Health Policy at Meharry. Um, I'm Mariah Cole. I'm the Director of Program Management in the Center for Health Policy. Good afternoon, Dexter Samuels, Executive Director of the Center for Health Policy at Meharry. So we want to first just say thank you for having us over here and have given us an opportunity to talk about choosing how I live life, which we call CHILL. Um, as you know, we already have the, the grant right now, and we work with um, young men at Whites Creek High School. And so um, our pro proposal um, purpose is going to remain the same, is that we are reducing juvenile offenses among current, and now we're going to be expanding the program participants, and we're using aggressive aggressors, victors, and bystanders, which I'll talk about a little bit more. We're also using mentoring and service learning. I want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as we know, uh, this issue of youth violence uh, is really a dire straits uh, when you look at it from a local as well as a national perspective. And in 2018, there was a study done by the Brookings Institute. Uh, and the Brookings Institute looked at incarceration rates and also they looked at uh, workforce development issues in terms of uh, how can then uh, ex-offenders uh, get reacclimated into the system. Uh, and it was really disturbing when you look at uh, some of the data points. At the bottom 10 percentile uh, of the population in terms of those individuals in terms of income uh, compared to those at the top 10 percentile, uh, there was uh, roughly 20 times uh, of the rate of incarceration rates for those individuals that are on the, the, the bottom 10 percentile. Uh, when you look at uh, individuals at the 1 percentile, the bottom of the 1 percentile compared to the top 1 percentile, uh, that number explodes to 40 times in terms of incarceration rates. Uh, but what's most disturbing is when you looked at uh, the various cities uh, that had the highest incarceration rates. Uh, and I'm uh, ashamed to say that uh, Nashville uh, was number one, 37208. Uh, had the highest rate of incarceration during this time period from 1999 to 2014. Uh, so we've got to do something uh, about that. You know, that's right really at the footsteps uh, of Meharry and Fitz. So we believe that we are uh, well positioned to address this particular issue. Uh, um, when you look also at 37207, they were number uh, uh, 38 in terms of rates of incarceration. Uh, again, at 37208, the rates of incarceration rate was 14%. Uh, uh, that's just really too high. Uh, and so we believe that this CHILL program will address it because what we don't want to do is we don't want to have anything in place that's really after the fact. Uh, we want to make sure that we focus on more from a preventative standpoint. Uh, and so we understand and believe that this CHILL program has been very successful and we want to expand uh, uh, the program. Uh, the other need also when you look at just the uh, cost uh, in terms of economic impact, it's about $158 billion when you look at nationwide uh, the economic impact then of youth violence. So again, that's something that we need to address. Then also when you look at uh, the data for Nashville for our youth, uh, in 2000, uh, in 16, 17, there were about 20 individuals, 20 youths uh, that died of a homicide. You know, that's 20 too many. Uh, and, and before we move on, I was thinking about, uh, you know, how can we address this issue? And one thing that came to my attention uh, was a, a few years ago in a different capacity, uh, we were looking at the paper and saw that there was a young man that was interested in coming into this higher ed education system uh, and had a dream of going into uh, higher ed. Um, filled out the application, got in, submitted the, uh, his uh, deposit uh, for housing and was just hanging out with some friends innocently, uh, nothing really uh, uh, negative going on, uh, and was unfortunately a victim of a drive-by shooting. Uh, and I had to write a, a letter to the family returning the $200 for a housing deposit, and it, it took me about three days to write that letter. It was probably one of the hardest things that I had to do. Uh, and, and so in my mind, uh, I believe that something like CHILL uh, would potentially have made sure that this individual would know uh, and the individuals involved uh, uh, why not uh, uh, to be involved in anything relative to youth violence. So we believe this program is something that can be effective uh, more broadly than the scope that we're focusing on now. 
Right, and, and after outlining the problem, as Dr. Samuels has done so eloquently, um, we have a proposed solution, which you'll see on the slides, and it's what I've mentioned, the aggressors, victims, and bystanders um, curriculum. It's one of the only curriculums that um, focus on the role of a bystander, so a person who is um, not actively participating, but there and witnessing um, some conflict of some sort um, and what their role is in quelling the situation or attempting to stop the situation. It also obviously focuses on the aggressor and the victim. It uses a, a four-step think-first model, which um, you know advises students or young people to stay calm first, um, determine what their role is, um, to think through their response and then to act accordingly. Um, and so we um, have it listed out the activities that will do those objectives um, ultimately with the goal of reducing or preventing youth violence um, with our program participants. Uh, we also have um, implemented group learning or group uh, mentoring with mentors who come and talk to um, our young men about um, their experiences. Um, what the goal is to give them greater connectivity, to make them feel like they're part of um, a community, um, a school, um, an organization that's bigger than themselves, and so that they can feel connected to something um, and build resiliency. The last one is service learning projects, which also helps to build resiliency and give um, young people connectedness into something bigger than themselves. Size of impact. Um, so, with our current program going into White's Creek, of course, we use the ABB model. And what the ABB model allowed us to do was not only talk about conflict and violence, but also get the students to open up about other issues. And so, um, one of our our sessions was called the fight in your head and I'm just going to read a few statements from the students about things they thought they were fighting against um, I'm fighting the thoughts of my past I'm fighting demons in my head low grades in the absence of my father I'm fighting the weight of my mother doing things all by herself it's very stressful I'm fighting people around me I have fear of being lied on by others I'm fighting the thoughts of not being successful. I'm fighting with the struggle of finding a job. I'm fighting with improving my grades and going to college. And I'm fighting with the fear of death. So a lot of these students are aware of their community, aware of their realities. And sometimes the conflicts are the violence that they interact that they are led to or that they are involved in it comes from these underlying issues and these underlying fears so with using the AVB curriculum we have been able to have the students open up and not only impact hey think before you act and, and give them the, those small tools to control their temper We've also been able to impact like their entire livelihoods, how they interact with their peers, how they interact with their family members, and how they interact with strangers. And this has allowed them to have a broader perspective on life that goes beyond the halls of White's Creek or goes beyond their, their apartment or their community. And it has also helped to impact other people in the building. So a lot of the students felt that teachers or administrators in the building were against them because of their record, because of their suspensions, because of their run-ins with the law. They thought these people were automatically against them, but having those individuals come in and observe the students in the CHILL program sessions, it has now like built a community around them. Yes, they're going to make mistakes, but hopefully they won't continue to make those same mistakes. So now we're not only impacting the student, we're impacting the school environment to get them to change their mindset. And then we're also impacting the parents. So the students have get, gone to their parents and told them things that they're doing in the CHILL program. And we've actually had a parent come out of his shell and come to share his missteps in life to let the students know, like, hi, this is my son. Yes, he's here in the program, but I want him and you all to know these are the things I did that were wrong, and this is where, you know, they led me. 
but this is the life you can have if you turn your life around. So I think our impact is, go is going beyond the students that we are we're touching in the sessions. It's also going into the administrators in the building as well as their families, and that's the impact we want to have. We want to reach out and change the community and have everybody's mindset change around conflict and violence. Um, in terms of our evaluation plan, um, we are, you know, every year giving the students the ACES test, Ad Adverse Childhood Experiences, which is a short survey. Um, we do the ABB pre and post test to see if they've learned the material presented, and then a monthly survey, more pragmatic programmatic about the experiences that they're having in the program. Um, we found, and Terika can talk more about it, that um, students are a little hesitant to, to do more in-depth um, sort of risk assessments um, that ask about their lifestyle, that ask about their home life. You know, they're asking questions about who's going to see this, um, you know, will my caseworker see it, will my foster parents see it. And so um, we found that these surveys sort of get at what we need to get from the students while really respecting um, their privacy um, um, and their autonomy and, and sharing their, you know, really personal information. So our expenses um, are listed here. Um, a lot goes into the planning and the execution of the program and aligning the right people with the students um, because the wrong presenter in front of them could have everybody in the room just silent are bottled up or unwilling to share or the wrong material may have them feeling like they're being monitored or studied. And so um, we dedicate a lot of our expenses to things such as having food available at the sessions. And so our sessions are usually in the morning during a B block and a lot of the students have not eaten breakfast. And so there are times, and they're just like, can you bring Pop-Tarts? Can you bring, like, so that we could take with us after we leave the session? Can you bring extra water so we could put in our bag after the session? So um, we put a lot of resources in to helping them with their, their basic needs because if you're hungry, you know, if you're hungry, you're not paying attention in class. Um, and the students seem real responsive, you know, knowing that I'm coming here, I'm getting this education on conflict management and violence, but I also, I also have an opportunity to have breakfast. I know that, like, when I attend this chill group session this week, I know I'll have breakfast and probably some snacks that I could take for the rest of the, for the rest of the day. And one thing we incorporated into our budget that wasn't, um, into our proposed budget last year was family nights. Um, now that we see the interest of family and other community members with the program, uh, incorporating family nights where we can have a night that the parents come out and share with the students and the parents just come out and interact and not have to worry about everything that's going on. Just have a night where you can bond and um, be open and have a meal and just share with one another. And before, before you go on to the impact, I just want to say, and I don't think we, we probably made it clear in the proposal, but we haven't said that this year we're going to be expanding to McKissick Middle School. So we're going to be going, um, and Dr. Samuels mentioned the zip code 37208, which is where McKissick is, and then 37, Seven. Three, seven, two, seven. <laughs> which is where uh, McKissick is. And so um, we, you know, pinpointed these um, schools, which are in these um, zip codes because of those reasons, and really wanted to start earlier with the, um, our participants. It will be in McKissick. And our budget kind of reflects that, um, that increased student participation. So impact return on investment. Um, as we mentioned before, we feel like the impact is turning communal life. Not just the students, um, but the, the teachers and the administrators, um, their families are all learning that if our students are taking these steps to redirect their thinking and learn how to deal with conflict, we are gonna get on board with them. We're gonna support them. We're gonna help them in this effort. And, um, with everyone coming to the same page is beneficial for the community, which is the ultimate impact. Um, 
our prior experience is listed here. Uh, we currently have the CHILL program. Uh, the ABB program was implemented before we implemented it at Weiss Creek uh, with Martha O'Brien and also in Shelby County Schools. And um, if you look down at our uh, outcomes, um, the participants in our program have self-reported no new criminal offenses, and 81% of the participants have attended school regularly, missing one or two days, which was one of our goals um, last year when we came in to have students come regularly. So um, there are days where I'm at White's Creek to meet with the Community Health Academy, which is another um, group of students we work with, and I'll see a chill student, and they're like, hey, we have chill today? I didn't know. So they're, they're <laughs> excited about coming to the program um, and being present and giving their input. And also not listed here, we had one senior student when he started, um, he was one of the people that fear, you know, finding a job. So he, he got a job at FedEx and he came in and he started telling all the other um, young men about the benefits of working at FedEx. Just something simple like you get a discount on your phone bill. So for them to hear him listing all the benefits, they were like, hmm. So it got them to thinking and writing down information and who should we contact, what do we have to do. So that positive impact and influence from him coming and we say, hey, here are places you can apply, like working with the school counselor. Here are places you can apply for, for part-time work. And then the other students actually seeing him accomplish this. Like for us, that may not be something big, but for them, that was like everything. And so trying to follow in his footsteps, um, I think that's a, a great outcome. And then um, one of the things we do, we might like call on a person and say, hey, how would you deal with this? And so like we've pretty much gone around round robin around the room with most of the students and each of them could, could off the top of their head give two ways how to deal with the situation that they couldn't before in the beginning. Um, and that's, that's really impressive to us because that lets us know that they're listening, that lets us know that they're employing these uh, actions in their, their daily activities at school and walking away from situations um, where before they have flown off the handle. Something as simple as being tardy to class and getting sent to the office and, you know, being in an uproar with the administrators. So um, we're very proud that the young men that have uh, been a part of this program are seeing how they can improve their lives and uh, make a better way for themselves. Um, program execution team. I serve as the program director. Um, Dr. Samuel serves as our PI. Miss Moore is our AVB teacher at Weiss Creek High School, and she has been a great asset. She actually um, is a former social worker, and she's working as the social emotional um, counselor at the school. Um, and the students are very receptive of her, and I think that's made a difference. Um, they know when they come into the domain of the of the chill sessions that they could trust her, and they could trust the individuals that she's bringing in and um, they're very responsive. And also we have mentors. So we have medical, dental, and graduate students from Meharry that come over and speak with the students and tell them their story. A lot of uh, the students surprisingly have been through situations that are similar to the student, the Wise Creek students in the room. So it's helpful for them to hear someone talk about growing up without uh, going a whole day without having a meal or um, becoming a latchkey kid, your mom or dad is at home or it's just your mom. Um, then we also have firefighters come out and talk to the guys. Um, we've had re different religious leaders come out that the guys knew that came and talked to them. Um, we've had college admission staff talk to them as well as business owners just for them to see that there are people out in the community that care about them, that are concerned about them, they have a story to tell, and they would like to share it with the students and let them know that despite your obstacles, 
you too can reach whatever goals you set forth before yourself. Um, something simple as them hearing that um, they could get a CDL license even if they have um, a record. Like that changed some of their minds. Like, really? I could go on the road? I could travel? And so just having those opportunities and resources there um, were very helpful. Um, in terms of our, our timeline, we are going to, um, particularly with McKissick, because we haven't worked there with this program, spend um, most of the summer um, planning, uh, making sure that we have the right people in the right place. Um, and I'll talk about this on the sustainability plan, but one of the good things about the ABB program is that it's a train-the-trainer program. So if one person at McKissick or at Wife's Creek gets trained, that person can train other staff um, in the school. And so it can become institutionalized in their programming, either in, in school or even in after-school programs. And so um, it's our hope and our dream that when we go to McKissick, we find the right person there, like we found at Wife's Creek, um, to train on the on the AVB program. They are already, you know, very interested in looking forward to working with us during that time. And so we'll be spending the summer planning and then rolling out the um, AVB and mentoring sessions throughout the semesters. Um, we take a break in the, for some, for Christmas break, and then we come back and do the, do the same in the spring and do the um, reports out to Ms. Hudson. And then with the sustainability plan, I, I sort of explained it, but, but ABB is a trainer trainer program. Mentors can do it, um, counselors, coaches, teachers, anybody there. And so, as I mentioned, it can become institutionalized. Um, you don't have to have um, separate time away from class to do it. You can do it in class, um, and you can you know, make it just a part of regular curriculum that they're already receiving. Did you want to say anything? Uh, also, um Metro Schools has a Community Achieves initiative, and um, so there are select schools they're trying to improve, and White Creek High School and McKissick are both a part of the Community Achieves. So um, at White Creek, they just received a new Community Achieves staff person, and they are starting to work with us with the CHILL program, and it's our hope that that person, um, even if Meharry wasn't present there, that that person um, will carry on the torch for us and the community achieves person at McKenzie we hope to formulate a partnership with um, him as well so that like, like Mariah said they can be trained in the ABB program and also start to incorporate um, the curriculum and some of the activities into the school just beyond the select group of students maybe with other students in the school as a, a coping mechanism to deal with conflict and violence or just to address some of the underlying issues that the students may be dealing with. Five minutes. What's the total projected chill budget for the next fiscal year? 50 or 100? 50,000. 50, okay. I don't know if you know your budget sheet. You list in the middle your grantee participation at 50, and if you added the two up, it would be 100. So it's just, oh, I mean, I the, whole center, the whole center column should be blank right. because clearly the only funding is coming from this grant, correct? That's yes. correct. Therefore, you're expanding, you're doubling your population for the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. My question is, how are you doing that? So we it's great. I, that's a wonderful thing because yes. we're going to get double the bang for the 50 if we give it to you. Right. But help us understand how that happens. So, so we have institutional funds that we utilize through the Center for Health Policy. And so as in kind, we're utilizing those resources within our Center for Health Policy to help subsidize. So the 50 is not the only, though, money that you're putting into it. That, that's correct. Okay. It'd be helpful for you all to show that okay. because it makes it helps it make a little bit more sense. More just yes. intuitive. You know what I'm saying? And yes. it's not a complaint. It's just helpful to your cause to show what Meharry is putting into it yes. in addition to just the 50 that's coming from the grant. Mm -hmm. Because I would argue to you that with the um, temporal nation, nature of local government funding, mm -hmm. it's helpful to everybody yes. to have something besides just the local government funding yes. and all that. So, okay, that's, thank you. Mm -hmm. Two minutes. Have you seen the success uh, as you ran the program this year at Watchbird? Have you uh, had, 
have the outcomes that you've seen observed, have they been on track with which, which, what you expected? Have they uh, been more, less? Um, I would say that they have been um, what I expected. Um, there were some students before we started the pro like initially started the program that I came into contact with just being at the school training and planning there were like will fly off the handle. I remember meeting one boy one day, he arrived at school, like he was just going off on everyone. And he's in the program. And the first day was kind of shaky. But as the sessions have gone on, and a lot of students look up to him because he's 11th grade. Right. So as the sessions have gone on, he become more level-headed. If he's having a, a, a bad day, he'll, he'll now verbalize it. It's like, I just left the class. It was not... I'm just gonna sit up, I'm listening, mm -hmm. but I'm just gonna sit over here. I might not answer any questions. And so him, and then there are a couple of brothers and other people that I could pinpoint in the program, just seeing their demeanor change. Or one individual, he kept getting into an argument with a girl in one of his classes. And just being in the program, He's just like, I don't even talk to her anymore. If she says something to me, I just ask the teacher, can I go sit somewhere else? Like, so them just being accepting of the curriculum and the steps that we're giving them is very um, promising. And the fact that um, the, the juniors and seniors are looked up to, so the, the freshmen that are in the program, the sophomores are like, oh, hey, so and so is not doing that anymore. So maybe I should, maybe I should stop walking around with my hood on. Maybe I should pull up my pants. So I think that the um, that the students are are really showing that they care about changing and that they want to to make a difference. And another thing that I did mention is some of them have been partnered with uh, mentors at Meharry where they they text back and forth. Like we'll have a student doctor that text them like, hey, you doing okay? Anything happened this weekend? Because a lot of time Mondays are rough. Like that period between leaving school Friday and coming back on Monday is very rough. So just checking in via text or or a student might um, let me know, hey, I text so-and-so. I don't know what's going on, but they, you know, they're not doing too well. And then I could tell the counselor, be on the lookout for just in case they're not having a good day. Um, we don't want them to get into any trouble because some, something happened on the weekend. So I think the program um, has a lot of promise and that the students have been really receptive and, and really working to change. Can I add just uh, quickly, I know the time is short. Uh, to me, it's really exceeded uh, expectation because you would think that with the number of individuals that are participating, that you'd have some type of uh, uh, criminal offense that would occur just based right. on their track record, and to right. have absolutely none uh, really speaks to uh, the nature and the impact of the program. All right. And that's a good point. I would suggest with that that it, uh, uh, if you will uh, reach out to us, we can check our records to see. I mean, hopefully, what's being self-reported by the is 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 accurate. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, if something has happened. They will tell you, you know, most yeah, of them. So, I mean, the odds are it probably is is accurate. But it'd be good to yes. that to check that independently against our mm -hmm. records too, to see, you know, um, if there have been any differences. I suspect, though, if there have been, it probably is a very small percentage. We'll do that. Concluding statements. If, let me ask one quick question because yes. I think it's important. I'm sorry. Yes. Five hundred thousand dollars of funds of, from eleven applicants in this yes. process this year. What happens and what can you do if you get less than $50,000? Does it, is the whole program in jeopardy? I think uh, the scope would be limited. Uh, we'd have to decide uh, rather than having two sites, um, maybe just one site. I think the issue is really what kind of impact can you really make uh, with one site in terms of extending, and as Mariah talked about, the sustainability, because what we believe is you really have to have a pipeline program. What we don't want is a pipeline uh, to the prisons. We want a pipeline to the educational system, uh, and that's why we have to reach back to the middle schools, and they're really in dire need at McKissick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sure. Sure. How's it going? I'm, 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 I'm ready to start.
Oh, we have. <laughs> Just like oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess we got a fact checker here. <laughs> <laughs> Rest assured. Uh, I mean, Dexter Samus may never speak to me again. Oh so. my God. Why do we have the, the hard ass in here? <laughs> we had to have one. He wasn't know. here last year. No, 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 no. What did we you do that for? No, we decided we need to bring sorry. a big gun. I'm not sure. Can the clicker work? Uh, hey, uh, you, you may just have to ask her to. I'm just to gonna ask her to do it. We're, 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 we're technologically prepared. We're so happy to get what we have. I'm just gonna scroll unless you want your colleague to scroll. It's. Uh, you don't think that'll work? Then? She said it won't. Oh, okay. Um, we had earlier had you tried one. Okay. Difficulty, so we're gonna. We'd rather just. Come. All right. Would you like your cup? Scroll. Yeah, I've been scrolling all day. She'll gladly yeah, we'll just scroll. Point, just, tell, okay. just tell her to move the slide. Okay. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's a pro. I'm a banana. <laughs> we have with this. Um, Can I buy that? Is everybody ready? Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. We have the Oasis Center of Nashville with us this afternoon. This is our final presentation, and I'll let you begin your session. I'm Ronnie Stein. I'm representing the mayor's office. I'm Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. Jim Swack, uh, deputy court administrator at juvenile court. Major Carlos, director of juvenile detention center. Do, Do we need to move the microphone if they're standing up there? Just move that. There you go. That'll help. We're ready to go ahead and get started. <laughs> Okay, it's a whole lot. Let's make this happen. Well, I'm Taylor McGee. I want to say, first of all, thank you for allowing us to come do this presentation. On behalf of the Oasis Center and the real program. Before I get too deep into our PowerPoint, our presentation, I want y'all kind of get in the mind space of a young person. Okay? I want y'all think about a time when y'all feel like y'all belong somewhere, that y'all was a part of something, that y'all had an identity. I want y'all to think of an adult, a role model, a mentor that made you feel like you could do anything. Reach anywhere you wanted to reach. For the last 10 years, the real program has been this place for the young people that it serves. And because of funders like y'all, we'll continue to make the real program a reality for the young people to have a place that they feel secure, that they are impacted. So we want to just say thank you again on behalf of the Oasis Center and the real program. Let's scroll. Get it all up there if you can. What, oh, what makes Oasis Center distinct is that we're a comprehensive agency for young people that has 22 different programs. Um, all of the programs use a trauma-informed approach, positive youth development, and evidence-based practices. We have some common impact areas, but we certainly have special ones for real. And what puts us apart, too, is knowing that we don't want to just beat the odds one by one. We got to change the odds for all these youth. And real reaching excellence as leaders serves all males. And because they're overrepresented by people of color in the juvenile justice system, 95% are young males of color. They are impacted by, there's one more slide that goes up here, by these injustices around here. And what we do is we take youth, develop their skills, help them lead change so that they no longer have to deal with the school to prison pipeline. Juvenile Court knows more than most about the passage in that initiative, Positive and Safe Schools, Advancing Greater Equity. Because of the work through passage, elementary school arrests have gone way down this year, and next year they're eliminated. Well, actually, since January, the policy went into effect. That was a great collaboration with Juvenile Court. As Shelley knows, we've been working on youth homelessness as part of the HUD grant. It goes on and on, but youth are at the center of the leadership, and that's what's key. And that's something I want to share with you. My Brother's Keeper is a national movement that Oasis got to go out to Oakland, take two of our real alumni youth, 
have someone from the mayor's office in charge of diversity and equity and have the juvenile court clerk all be a part of it along with Joe and Tay and myself. And you're going to see more of that. Watch this space. For 10 years now, Real has been operating, providing life-changing diversion. And never before have we had such a strong commitment from juvenile court to provide diversion for these young people. The research is there. To prevent young people going into custody, we need to divert these young people. One thing when you look at this slide, and there's more to it, if you could just get it all up there, is that overwhelmingly these homicides are youth of color. They are both the victims and perpetrators, <coughs> overwhelmingly so. Way too many times. Programs like the real program are so important. They're not optional. They're needed. In this community alone, between 2010 2015, almost 17,000 young people were involved in the violent crime. 43% involved with the homicide. That means for every other homicide, one of those bodies was a young person. These programs are so impacting and so needed because it don't just affect the young people, right? It affects the whole community, medical, graduation rates, incarceration rates, the taxes. So if we ain't investing in our young people, that's us not investing in the future. We have to be sure that we're giving young people all the tools they need to be successful. Next slide. So the real program kind of breaks down like this. Each program, each cohort runs for three days out of the week. We're lined up with MNPS calendar. So if it ain't no school that day, it ain't no program. If there is school, there's program. And we do it like that for the young people say, Mr. Tay, I didn't know I had school. Or well, I didn't know I had program. You knew you had program for the school, right? So that's the reason we set it up like that. But there's so many different components within that program. And because I only have 15 minutes, I'm gonna have to break this down real quick. So you have to create a bigger vision within your head, right? <laughs> and this is how it works. So we have service projects. Those service projects can consist of a range of things. Everywhere from working with Second Harvest to doing volunteering, packaging for homeless, to doing direct service, to actually going out, making lunches, and giving it to the homeless. We also do programs with the young people that they feel are important, right? We always take their voice into consideration. We never go to the table and say, this is be the most impacting service project. We ask them what their needs are, what's important to them. How can we create something that you'll feel empowered by? We did a, a service project just recently with a gentleman named John Hicks. He has his own nonprofit. And basically what he does is he gets the young people together, have people donate shoes. Then he teaches them how to customize it, paint them, repair them, and restore them. And then we donate them back to other young people who couldn't get them. So with this opportunity, it, it present, presents an opportunity young person first to be able to give. And also some of these moms, let's be honest, paying $200 a shoe. And then I think they'll be loving for these shoes to last as long as they can. And we also teach them about an app called StockX. What StockX does is get the opportunity for the young people, once they repair the shoe, to be able to resell the shoes. So we think that's a great component. We also have a, a partnership with Vanderbilt Law Clinic, right? And with a lady named Miss Kara Subble. And basically what this partnership is, if at any time a young person comes in some form of disciplinary at school, whether that's a suspension, whether that's expulsion, they'll have somebody from the law clinic to come and represent them and advocate them. And that resource is available to every young person that comes through the program. Also, they will advocate them if they find themselves in any type of criminal cases. And we also have another component called the family retreat. We know with our program, it's not only important to help the young people, but it's also important that the family are involved. So for one weekend, we have the families to come in and we share the information that we speak with their young people about. We make sure they are engaged, involved, we help them work on communication skills, and find another way to be, be a part of their family, be involved, be aware. Next slide. Oh. So these are some of the changes that we're looking for. 
increasing employability skills, family relationships, and this is self-report from the family, sense of belonging, and a positive identity. We do pre and post surveys and get capture that. But we're not just interested in avoiding reoffending. These guys leave with a sense of purpose, a new track record. They've completed something. When they go through graduation, the families are just beside themselves. Here are some of the, in, the, the impacts we see then as taking families. So that's Skirmahorn. We have another funder who's also generous with us who makes sure that they get to cultural events that they wouldn't otherwise, and we invite their whole family. So they got to see Maxwell that night. Here, our young guys are wearing suits that they got from graduating to help explain the mural that they did at Hadley, an area where they live, putting forth positive images. It was a mural based on a Kendrick Lamar song of turning a caterpillar into a butterfly. Um, here, they're doing mock uh, interviews. And here we took, for the 50th anniversary of Selma, a busload down with Freedom Riders. We're trying to have a lasting, long-term impact, which you'll see at this last slide. This is what we're going for. We just don't want to reoffend. We want them to be employed and in school, having a sustainable career. Um, and we do that through the different components that you've already heard about. Um, OK. <laughs> And here are some of the indicators. So we're getting the data on a regular basis. We can make modifications as we go. If we're not getting the results we're expecting, we have three external monitors. YPQA is a NASA coach who comes in and monitors. Tay got outstanding scores. Um, here we turn in some of this to both the Wyman Center and EMT. It's a research outfit in California. And again, it's all leading back to improving our services. Next slide. Here is our financial model. You'll see that most of it's in personnel, no big surprise. Um, and then program operations is 12%. We have an emergency fund, client assistance, so people need new tires to get to work, prescriptions that they can't get filled. There's an application process for that, and then our admin costs. We're asking for the green slice of pie from you guys today, $50,000. The whole budget is about $137,000. We're proud that we've done this kind of layered funding so that we can provide the maximum to our young people. And this year, we got a new one, a full, it's a foundation called Impact Nashville, all women. We could not believe they gave to the program that serves only males. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> An open mind. Yeah, yeah totally. So um, the return on investment, I mean, this is shocking. We did not make this up. And it comes out of Vanderbilt. So there you have it. But 2.6 million to 5.3 million is what we say by diverting one 14-year-old youth from crime. Um, we can get at that by seeing what the daily cost for real is what incarceration is. I don't know, Adrian might know better, but we had it at $300 a day. Then you add to that the lost earnings. If we don't maximize the potential of everyone in our community, increased <laughs> con crime costs go up, then public assistance, of course, gets added to that, and just the cost of victimization. So this is a wise investment. We hope you see that. Um, one thing we learned, so we have another, we have a Department of Labor grant that also works with youth impacted by the juvenile court or adult courts. It's now for 18 to 24 year olds. But we learned from the 11 grantees, we were one of them that missed the mark on those. And what we think is the cohort model. If you just send kids out one by one to get a job, it doesn't work so well. We're learning that through opportunity now for juvenile court referred kids too. This year we're gonna try and pilot one side, a woodworking site that will serve three kids from real and see if that doesn't do better. So we learn as we go when we, we have faced disappointments, but by and large, we're really killing it. Um, that reward maybe for a violence prevention. But um, real key impacts, 85% avoid reoffending. We're always higher than that. 70% um, improve employability, 80% have stronger decision-making and problem-solving skills, increased family connectedness, 
and then engage with a caring adult. I know y'all like to believe that it's only Judy and myself that are on the program, <laughs> but it's a whole staff of us to make all these things possible. Again, myself, the program coordinator, Mr. Joe Ferris right here, the prevention specialist, our supervisor, Ms. Rokisha Bryant, and of course, Ms. Judy, VP of YA program. Or OG. OG is what they call her. <laughs> OG is what they call she's been doing right. this. <laughs> but um, when we talk about the staff of the real program of the Oasis Center, we don't just say the ones that are uh, in direct service. Everybody in the community is part of the staff. You all are part of the staff. Making sure that the young people are getting everything they need to cultivate them and empower them to reach their trajectory of goals that they can. So everybody is part of the staff. But again, this picture right here too is when we had the opportunity to go out to Oakland for the MBK. I think there's a few more on this. Yeah. Okay. You just want yeah. To... And we really rely on volunteers as mentors and have them in every session. Next slide. With the real program, 92, I'm going to check this, make sure I got this right. 92% of the young people who graduate with the real program don't reoffend. That's speaking to something. Most programs you've got, the first thing the young people this program says is, don't do this, don't do that, right? But when you're saying that, you're not replacing that with something to do, with something that is productive. And that's what the real program is doing. It's not only showing them things that they will be better off doing, but it's showing them the path to reach these goals based off of what they consider to be successful. 92% of every young person come to this program, excuse me, will do at least two service projects. 95% of the young people that come to this program, at some point in time, once they graduate, feel more connected to their community. And that's so important. When you feel like you got identity, you feel like you're something, you feel like you're important in that community, it makes you feel more responsible. It makes you feel more accountable. And 100% of the young people that come through the program has some involvement or experience with college. For example, one thing we do with the young people is we actually have them to go and participate in an active classroom at TSU. And this is every cohort. So when they have all these stigmas and negative thoughts that they've been told that they don't belong in these colleges, we let them actually sit down and see everybody looks just like you. Everybody entertained by the same thing, but they want to reach goals and they choose to take this path. And we're going to show you through the real program how to make it happen. Next slide. And here's our track record. So we're on the upswing. That's good. Um, we also are working upstream. And as I already mentioned, that's very important as far as trying to improve the conditions that impact our young people and our community. So we do that through passage. Right now, the handbook for discipline has been redone so that the loopholes are plugged and principals can no longer, we'll see, um, use some of those behaviors to expel young people. So we're working on that. We're part of a longitudinal study out of the National Institute of Justice. Our young people are the most interesting part of the project, is what I'm told by the pr principal investigator, and they're mapivists. So they're training young people to go out and map where they feel assets in the community are, and where they don't feel welcomed, and they feel discriminated against, and thinking through, how can we change these things? Um, we have been a consultant with juvenile court on LGBT affirming uh, efforts, and we also are one of the zone partners for Opportunity Now that grew out of the Mayor's Youth Violence Prevention Task Force, which our real young boys really helped inform. We hear it's being reconstituted. I'm sure you know more about that. And again, we're going to make sure real guys are at the table for that and see what comes out of that one. And we're building our evidence as we go. We have now a group that we can submit for SPEP. Um, and we're utilizing TOP, and Rokisha's helping us with that. We'll get SPEP more. SPEP stands for? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was easy. I know. It's 
protocol evaluation program. That's what it, yes. <laughs> anyway, the idea of it is you don't have to go through the journals and get um, random assigned research on your project to figure out if your project is effective in reducing recidivism. So it finds out what your core components are, how it matches up with evidence ones, mm -hmm. and if you're getting better results than not. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're, that's our presentation. Y'all have 10 minutes of Q&A available? Thank you. <coughs> what are your questions? And we'll like to include our colleagues in helping answer. First of all, did y'all like the presentation? Are you <laughs> well, we can regret. Because <laughs> that's all that really matters. <laughs> we we, show us we did our best. Not enough singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> And what I want to say to that, that's the entertainment that we bring in. <laughs> and that's the truth. We always make sure they come into an environment where they feel like they belong, that they can laugh. Sometimes we forget just to be a kid and have fun. And from that in the real program, they feel like they can apply to learn. So yeah, that's the environment we try to create with them. And that was reflected with My Brother's Keeper. Some of you probably know that got started after Trayvon Martin's death. President Obama realized this could have been him, this could have been his son, and made this pledge to my brother's keeper that is continuing for the rest of his life. And we all came together, and it was just joyous. It was not being depressed about everything that's going on. It was about celebrating. celebrating. And it, it really flipped the script, and we're bringing that to Nashville. Absolutely. Please have some questions. Yes. Seems like we got well, it. So <laughs> We're All right, fine so, with that. So just because you're being cocky, I'll ask. <laughs> I'll ask the least. I'm gonna talk to you later. I'll, I'll ask the least favorite question a nonprofit can be asked. We have a five hundred thousand dollar ask from eleven organizations this year for oh. CBF funds. So the question that everyone is being asked is. What happens if you don't get the full 50? What's the, well, I mean, obviously things aren't done. What, what, what is the effect down the line of what you're doing? Um, well, we probably wouldn't cut. We would look for more money before we would cut because with everything we do needs to stay there. There's not one thing we're doing that's unessential. And let me just say, we're, always beating the path for more funds. And there is a new guy over our state prevention funds that supports real as well as our other prevention efforts, which includes LGBT and immigrant and international youth. But I've already started working on him um, to say, because <laughs> they actually gave us extra money to start doing change work around LGBT issues. I'm asking him, what if we did that now with males of color? It's time. Nashville's really ripe for it, and we could disseminate it across the state. And he said, give me a year. I need to see how the funding goes, because there are unearned funds. But unless they give them to us on a regular basis, we can't make up the difference. But mm -hmm. our first bet is not to cut, just to keep looking. Mm -hmm. Okay. No any? questions is a good thing. No. <laughs> did y'all run any, into any unanticipated challenges this year as you, you know, were, um, you know, we awarded, you know, funding to you last year for this current fiscal year? Um, um, well, one thing is referrals were slow at the beginning of the year, but we have handled that. Um, these guys went and talked to all of the probation officers, yeah. and the referrals have been coming in. Okay. So that was probably our only challenge, and I, you know, the, there is a challenge, and we lose some youth, and that is sure. hard on all sure of us. Is. And I'm off yeah, no. And it, <laughs> another challenge is not having enough equipment sometimes to create the resources for these young people. That's a huge challenge. There ain't more programs like the real programs they can go and be a part of, take with, and be, and grow from. That's so. Reaching out to alumni is where we're looking at trying to increase to to keep them in the fold, because <clears throat> life happens, and yeah, we want to make sure they stay connected. I mean, these guys on graduation night are saying 
to the whole room and there's about usually about 75 people in the room to 100 because they bring their family members they're all in suits the parents are saying this superseded my expectations it was just going to be one more program where I, it didn't work for my this kid or his mm -hmm. brother mm -hmm. but they're amazed the young people speak out about what it's meant to them but trying to they say we're here for you for forever now we are family mm -hmm. but it's not that sustainable with just a couple of staff, so we need that alumni effort to it's continue. Right. And yeah. to expand. And yeah. it's not just how we feel about the program, right? Because we're going to say all day that it's the best program in the world, right? <laughs> it's what the young people, yeah. it's their responses, sure. their testimonies. Right. It's that part that we say we are effective, we are making an impact. Yeah, we were going to get one kid when they said, would you like to say a few words at this last graduation just a few well, weeks ago? He pulled out his phone and had written a speech, which I was supposed to get, and I was going to leave you guys a copy of that. But um, anyway, it's very meaningful. To Graduation know. is very tearful. Yeah. So it kind of gives you a lot of pictures, a lot of connection, and the track record of completing some. Yeah. Okay. Still no Thank questions. you. Thank you. Thank y'all so okay. much. Stein and representing the mayor's office. I'm Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. I'm uh, Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator at Juvenile Court. Adrian Crock is director of Juvenile Detention Center. Okay. Well, my name is Chan Shepard. I'm the executive director of Preston Taylor Ministries, and, and our team today excited to be presenting a program called uh, Go Deep. Um, on the left is Terrence French, our high school director. And Mary Margaret Randall is the uh, founder and executive director of One Voice Nashville. And then Dwight Johnson is the youth director at Preston Taylor Ministries. At, at PTM, we build a lot of our programming around a study called Hardwired to Connect. And that study concludes that there are two things that are far above other things in terms of preparing a, a youth to avoid some of the negative behaviors like violence. One is connection to a caring adult. The second is connected to a sense of purpose. So at PTM, a lot of our programming is built around building these connections. And we saw an opportunity to partner with One Voice Nashville to build four connections for students through a program called Go Deep, where we'll serve about 30 students who are 12 through 17. Those connections are connection to a caring adult, connection to a sense of purpose, connection to self, and connection to a positive fear group. Okay, so I um, have these sheets you can have one pass it. Um, for One Voice Nashville, we um, will exist as an arts enrichment partner. Um, we already have a partnership with Preston Taylor through an after school program that's going on right now. Um, and for this first piece, connected to a sense of self, um, our curriculum moves through my story, your story, our story. So with the my story piece, we get a small group of students together, um, usually you know a maximum of 10 students at a time, and they go through stories that really have shaped, shaped their life. So um, they craft one story to focus on, whether it's um, a time that they met their best friend, or a time that they moved, or some kind of experience, and they really get a lot of feedback and time and energy on that one story to tell it showcase. Um, in this picture, we have Kevin from um, one of our summer camps, and he's telling a story about how he used his size to become a bully in school, and then halfway through the year, realized that he could you know, use that size and that power to transform to be a, a positive role model and a leader. Um, for showcase, we have usually a setting like this in a classroom. Um, depending on the setting, we really want the youth to uh, have a say in who's at the showcase. So like when we do a, a program at the Juvenile Detention Center, we don't invite their peers. We invite just youth um, that, that have the adults in the room that they know and trust. So we just want to create a safe space for showcase. That's the main thing. And this really builds confidence. We have a lot of feedback from adults that say this is the first time this youth has looked me in the eye. Um, so that's what we're really trying to capture here. Um, the second connection that we would like to explore and continue to go deep in is the connection to a caring adult. Um, all 30 of our youth will be in either a mentoring program known as Junior and Devo, which serves high school students, 
or um, breakfast and Bible study, which serves our middle school students on Thursday mornings. So Dinner and Devo is a weekly uh, mentoring program where we partner our students with uh, caring adults. They meet up, we take an hour where they go through the devotional, but they also uh, talk about what's going on in their life. So they partner with an adult, but they meet with at least one hour a week. And then breakfast and Bible study is similar. That meets on Thursday mornings. That serves our middle school students. And those students meet with a mentor from 6.45 to 7.45 on Thursday mornings for 30 weeks for the whole school year. And during that time, students have a meal, have breakfast, an ice-breaking activity, and then one-on-one -on -one time with a mentor that's around a, a biblical text where they set goals together for the week and they pray, pray together. And also think about our caring adult aspect is that each of these students are partnered with their mentor. Um, we've had, we have some students that partner with their mentor for the duration of their middle and high school careers. So it builds longevity. And the other piece that we would um, dive into is our spring break in the marketplace program, um, which is during the MNPS uh, spring break week. Uh, we take these 30 students um, and we um, get them involved and get them um, exposed to the job market here in Nashville. So they go undergo an application process um, that includes an interest survey where they have an opportunity to actually sit down and think through, hey, this is what I want to do when I grow up. This is what I want to be. These are some of the jobs that I want to be exposed to. And so the, we then as a staff take that application um, and we go into the city and we say, and we look and say, who, how can we connect students to some of these interests? But we also want to make sure that we connect students to opportunities that they may not even be tracking because ultimately we want students to be exposed to all all of the opportunities that await them, um, both in this city and beyond. So during that spring break in the marketplace week, um, one of these 30 students could uh, job shadow anywhere between three to seven uh, adults throughout the course of the week. And so all of these different jobs would be different hints of exposure to different opportunities uh, for them to look forward to as they're maneuvering through middle and high school and graduation. Um, another opportunity and connection to a caring adult from the One Voice Nashville enrichment piece. Um, the students will go through a section in the curriculum, it's called Your Story on that one sheet page. And each student picks a topic that they are interested in, and then we bring an adult from that field who's an expert in the topic um, for interviews. So we have all across the board, it could be a hobby that they're interested in, it could be um, a career interest. Um, but again, those, the more opportunities for one-on-one -on -one mentorship, the better. Um, so we provide that experience for the interview section and really capturing critical thinking skills and building the you know, open-ended uh, you know, critical questions that they create. And then also building empathy and listening skills for this one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, another thing that we do for showcase, and the students don't always know it, usually we try to make it a surprise, but every student gets a, an award. And so they really get a lot of um, attention. You know, we have for the showcase, the adults step out of the way. We usually have a youth MC it. But then after each story is presented, each, stu each student gets a, um, a reward. So it could be resiliency award, a focused award, just, you know, we really want to create an opportunity for every student to be honored and, and you know, celebrated. Another um, connection piece is positive peer group. This is why we, uh, we really don't want a larger group than 10. So for this opportunity, we would, we would separate into smaller groups. Um, and that's really come from um, the experience of the smaller group, the more um, ability for them to trust each other, to go into kind of the deeper stories that they, they want to you know, work through. Um, for this, again, this is a summer camp picture. We have Kevin in the middle from our picture earlier. And then one of the students in this circle was talking about just kind of in downtown how she'd gone through this journey of um, issues around her body image and stuff like that and just kind of self-care. And immediately the circle just uh, kind of engulfed her. And so this really shows this, you know, was a natural thing that happened when you have that opportunity to, to allow students to be themselves and, um, and share their stories. And then one of my previous students at the juvenile detention center was talking about how through this experience, he was able to just put his emotions on paper without judgment. For creative writing, I never, I or whoever's facilitating are trained never to read their work unless the students want to share it. And it's just a time of, of no judgment so they can experience their emotional journey in that. Another connection that we feel like we can help create through Go Deep is connection to a purpose. 
We had, uh, about 12 years ago, had a conversation with a fifth grade boy, and he said, point blank, you're wasting your time with me, my dad's in jail, my cousin's in jail, and I'm going to be in jail. That reflects a stuckness that often happens in, in a neighborhood like the ones that, that we serve in. And for us, as we see students connected to a caring adult, connected to a positive peer group, we see them open their eyes to a hopeful future where they recognize that they're gifted, that they're, they're unique, and that they have something to offer the world. Right, and another way that um, the purpose piece comes in in the One Voice Nashville uh, enrichment curriculum for the, again, my story, your story, our story. So we really build in, into that, um, that awareness of their community, whether it's their neighborhood, their school. You know, after they've learned the skills of self-respect, self-care, and empathy, learning how to, to navigate through a conversation and listen to someone else one-on-one, -on -one, how do you give back to your community now that you've developed those skills? So civic engagement is kind of that third piece that we capture. I want to highlight a couple of the strengths of, of, the, of the program, including the, the partnership. So it's unique to, to PTM is a chance to partner with One Voice Nashville. We feel like that collaboration gives us a chance to take a, a smaller number of students than, than maybe uh, uh, other, other agencies are proposing, but to go, to go deeper through a variety of things. And what PTM brings to the table is an organization that's been around 20 years with an active board of directors and financial stability and a real commitment to one-on-one -on -one relationships that are long-term. And collaboration has been absolutely key to everything that we've done. And the thing about One Voice Nashville, you can pick it up and you can put it in a school, you can put it in a church youth group, you can put it at Juvenile Detention Center, and it really captures um, this confidence where critical thinking, civic engagement. So you can pick it up and, and you know, mirror it in any, in any group setting. So our collaboration piece is strong, and we um, have been working with the Juvenile Detention Center for the past four years, and the youth there have really come alive in this program. It's been really exciting to watch. Another strength of our Go Deep program proposal is that, um, one, our proximity to students. Uh, all of our sites are located um, in, in close proximity to students' homes, both in the 37208 and the 37209 zip code. Uh, we have five buses that are dedicated for the transportation of these students each day, Monday through Friday. Uh, we provide meals at every single one of our mentoring programs that uh, mentors and, and, and students are able to share together. And we also meet in a space um, that has been designed for and by youth. And it's a space that they like to be in, in, in a space that they had a say so in creating, um, in a space that they also are responsible for maintaining as well. Uh, another strength is um, experienced team. Chan has served uh, youth development for over 20 years. Uh, I've been in youth development for 19, my last two at PTM. Uh, Dwight, eight years with his last six at uh, PTM, and Mary Margaret, over 11 years of youth development for the last three at uh, One Voice National. The last strength that we kind of want to explore um, is the depth of student experience. Um, pictured here is James Patrick Stewart. Um, he started PTM in the third grade. Um, and li lived in the Preston Taylor kind of neighborhood area off of 28th. And he's a student who grew up without his father. Father was incarcerated at an early age, um, single parent mom, and a, s a special needs older brother that required a lot of, of his mom's attention. And so um, all those pieces collaborate. And JP grew up with a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, um, wasn't always the strongest performer in school. And over the last, oh, during starting third grade and moving into the middle school, high school program, JP had the opportunity to collaborate with countless mentors and adults who were able to pour into him. Um, and now, because of those collaborations and because of the stability of the programming that JP took, took advantage of, um, he graduated high school um, and then also he just graduated from TSU and is also finishing up his grad uh, master's degree from, in exercise science from TSU as well. And in this picture is his niece that was at his uh, graduation party. And one of the things that he asked was he wanted, he wanted this picture to look like this because he wanted his niece to have someone to look up to. He wanted her to know that there's someone that has overcome all these odds and that there's nothing in her, in her way or nothing that stands in, in between her and her becoming what she would like to be. And just uh, in, in closing, we 
we want this program and, and feel like this program can be one that makes a significant impact in the life of the youth and in their families. We also feel like we can sustain it financially. Um, PTM's built a reserve fund that would be able to help pick up where uh, funding might be short um, so that this is not a one-year opportunity but an investment that will carry significant dividend throughout. Um, over the last two years, we've, we've built up that reserve fund without the help of the development director, and we have a development director that will join our staff in May, which will be devoted to fundraising. So unfortunately, the, the money piece is a big part of what, what we can do, and we feel like that's the strength of our program, being able to sustain what we're asking this group to, to recommend as, as a funding partner. Go Deep is, in its totality, is a new concept. You all are already doing your breakfast and Bible studies and dinner and Devo, at least as a model. That's right. Okay, and the obviously the OVM part of this is you've done in lots of different ways. It just combined. Um, thank you for addressing the sustainability issue because clearly, obviously, your, the request here is for essentially the full funding of the program, even though I would urge you next time you do a budget to include what you estimated, what, $30,000 of volunteer time is indeed a grantee participation that really helps your efforts. So I would emphasize that even more going forward. Um, the, um, one other question about your program. The breakfast and Bible study part is for the sixth through eighth graders, and then dinner and Devo is through the older, for the older young people? Yes. Sir. Okay. Thanks. Does the uh, mentoring component, component that you refer to, is it, um, has that, if I was understanding correctly, was that basically that one hour a week, or was it? That, that's right. It's, it's one hour, one hour a week for a student in dinner and Devo or breakfast and Bible study. So let's take a, a 14 year old. That student would have 30 hours, 30 weeks for the year of that one on one mentoring. So it's, it's full school year. Additionally, that same 14 year old student would have three days of job shadowing in, over spring break. That same student would have a mentor through One Voice Nashville that would help prepare the story that would be presented at a showcase. Is there any, I'm just, is there any component of the program that um, is active um, during the summer break? One of the things that we put in our application is that if there were a referral from juvenile court, which we hope that there would be, and that that happens after December, then that student would have priority placement for summer programming okay. with One Voice Nashville. And so that's, that's a way for us to uh, accommodate and build our relationship with juvenile court. But for Go Deep, it would be hard to integrate a student halfway through the school year in one of the mentoring programs. Could you add anything to that? No, that's great. I think the, the part of our curriculum that I think is the most powerful is it builds very um, powerfully, and so the more mm -hmm. consistent the group, the better. But we definitely have room to add in, because we do we do fall programming, spring, and summer. Okay. Thank you. And my question was, the duration of um, Go Deep is 30 weeks, so that kid will be with each group for 30 weeks straight? Um, the One Voice Nashville group would be an eight-week okay. group, eight but for the mentoring for, for a full, full, full school year, and because we have relationships with the students that we would serve and their families, we would anticipate that being multi-year. Yeah. We have um, 11 organizations requesting $500,000 and our pot is 200,000. The least favorite question any group ever gets. <laughs> um, can, is PTM in a position that if you get less than $50,000, um, this program could go forward in some form or fashion? Yes, it could. 
Probably not at the at the okay. num number of students. Right. No, I, I get that. But but if if this group were to give us half of the amount, we would be able to serve half the students and feel like we could do a good job with that group. One of the other ways that I would I would hope y'all would look at this is if you invest this year in in a partnership, trusting that the experience that we would gain in working with each other and the, the attempts that we've already started to work together, that we would build on that without ongoing support from, from this, uh, from CPF. Okay. Thank you. Can you tell us something about the work you've, uh, you all mentioned you have uh, done work in our detention facility? Uh, can you tell us some more about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so One Voice Nashville, this is where I learned um, a lot of kind of small group, small group work is, is key to this work. Mm -hmm. I started there um, with about 15 students and some students liked to write, some didn't, um, which I'm okay if they, um, you know, if they are at least a little bit, you know, hesitant about writing, we can work with that. But um, I started to work with the principal there and ask for less students and let me um, interview them beforehand and really get to know them. Um, so I do... Um, a fall program and a spring program there, usually five to eight youth, and we'll continue to do that. Um, so we start uh, next week with our the next okay. round of youth, and we have our showcase prepared for um, a date in May. So we invite you know any adult to come to that. Okay. Thank you. So that's you and who else? Um, I've worked there in different capacities depending on the semester. So mm -hmm. I try to bring in mentors um, usually. Um, so the first semester, we did a, a program where, for the interview portion, um, it looks a little bit different because we can't bring in all the guests that you know we do at the Metro School um, site. So all the youth interviewed formerly incarcerated men, and so that was our first project. The second project we did, um, we had uh, people in the community who are actors, and they were the same race and gender of the student. And then they um, told their stories through a community showcase too. So we, everything that we do there is out of a relationship and what the youth want and what serves them. So like I said, this, this enrichment piece can be picked up and, and put into schools, churches, programs. Yeah. Thank you. Anything you'd like to close with? We're grateful. Grateful Thank for you. the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My witness was terrific. Oh, good. You listened really to that. Wow. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Great. Oh, that oh, means no. a lot. Absolutely. Good. It was terrific. I love it, too. Thank you. I'm Ronnie Stein. I'm representing the mayor's office. I'm Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. I'm uh, Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator at Juvenile Court. Agent Cartlidge, I'm the regular juvenile detention. Thank you. And I am Jewel Wynn. I'm the executive director and co-founder of From the Heart International Education Foundation. I'm Clinton Harris, president and CEO of Urban League. You guys good to see you. I'm Corey Harris, Director of the Sports for Life Program and Co-Founder of the Foundation. I'm Timothy Wynn, uh, Nutrition and Wellness. Okay, so thank you for, for having us. We're excited about the, the project. And just to give you a quick overview, uh, the mission of our organization, FTH, is to provide music and sports enrichment before school, after school, and during the summer for youth throughout Nashville and the surrounding communities, and of course, the Urban League's mission is to enable African Americans and other minorities and disenfranchised groups to uh, gain access to ec uh, economic sector lives, power, parity, and civil rights. Right. So, through um, through some of our colleagues, we were introduced, uh, Clifton and I and had several meetings, got our boards together, and realized that there was just a natural alignment between the work that the two organizations were doing. And we've been strategically planning over the last, I guess, eight, nine, ten months to make a lot of our uh, initiatives come to fruition. So we're really excited about it. 
So our target populations, um, we currently have work in, with MDHA. We do uh, quite a bit of work in the Levy, Preston Taylor, Andrew Jackson, J.C. Napier, Casey, and Vine Hill um, properties. And we provide those different programs in those communities. And our actual facility, it's called the Life House, is actually located in the Levy community. And MDHA donated the building to us. So we are extremely fortunate to have a rent-free, utility-free space that our children feel that they have a safe space to come um, every day. Um, also with MNPS, we have several contracts with those schools. So we are doing our restorative practices in those schools currently. Um, we do the sports program and the music program in those. And then, of course, our juvenile detention center work. Um, this is our going into our, well, we'll be going into our third year with the latest contract that we have. So we go in there and we work with the kids. Um, we basically bring a mobile studio into them to allow them the opportunity to express um, whatever it is that they're feeling or going through through lyrics. And last year was the first time we actually brought instruments in to them and allowed them to experiment. And it was tear jerking to see the response from, from those kids there. So those are our target populations. The program design, what we found is following the MNPS calendar is the best way to structure our programs. And that way, we can align with the, the breaks, spring break, fall break, all the other breaks, testing, and things like that. Um, what we do currently and what we hope to continue to do is to provide two to three, two to three days per week, plus Saturdays, um, with, the, with the outline that you'll see as we go through. Um, at the different locations, and then four to six hours per week. Um, Corey, through his um, experience and, and tenure with the NFL, and of course, uh, Tim, and all the directors have actually developed a curriculum. And um, the music curriculum has actually been published, and um, Corey's in the process of getting his finalized and vetted through uh, the NFL and getting it published as well. Uh, Trauma-informed care and adverse childhood experience. Uh, two of the grants that we've received previously, we had to have that training. Oh my goodness. Very intense, but very um, eye-opening for us. And we hope to get refresher training uh, because some things have changed, and uh, we will continue that training with the coordinator of um, that organization within the MNPS school district. So for example, for music, this is just, just an example. Um, but let me tell you just a little bit about the pictures you see up there. So the one at the top left is when um, Corey was in the NFL. Was that the Super Bowl game? No. Okay, that was the Super Bowl game. But anyway. The no, he's been beaten. The Titans didn't play the Ravens in the Super Bowl. Oh, well, that's right. They kept us, they I mean, kept us the, the Super Bowl, as I recall. Right, right. <laughs> don't hold that against us. Right. Okay. No. <laughs> don't, don't. This is one of the pictures that Corey uses when he's inspiring the young man and talking to the young man or whatever. And then the, the young man below is a master uh, martial artist who happens to be Tim's father. And some of the um, self-control tactics and things that, that Tim is working with the young guys on, of course, came from his father as a master martial artist. And at the top right there is uh, Trey Bird, the co-director of music, working with one of the kids and teaching them multitasking. He's teaching them drums, but he also has a saxophone in his hand. And then below is Carrie, uh, one of the co-founders as well, outside of the Live House, showing the computers that were donated by 3C, 3C, C3 Consulting. Um, Those two are I didn't mean to interrupt, but those two actually are out of the country right now, extending the relationship. They're in Cartagena. Yeah, Cartagena. They're in South, they're in uh, South America right now. So we've been mm -hmm. taking kids over there two since years. 2000, no, since three, 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're over there now, kind of extending the relationship. So that's why he's uh, he's not able to be yeah, here. Yeah, he was very sad that he couldn't be here, but that was already arranged. Um, so yeah, so that just to kind of explain why those pictures are there, just showing the intentional engagement with the kids and how much we are connected to the community and how much the community supports us and, and all of the things that we do. Uh, but that's just an example of how the day goes or the sessions go. Um, in the after school programs that we're currently doing now, that's just kind of a, 
a snapshot. Now that doesn't include what we would do during the summer, but that's what we're doing uh, during the day. And then on Saturdays, See, our Project Ready uh, program is a nationally uh, recognized program that is carried out in 89, uh, 89 other affiliates throughout you know, the country. We're one of 90 affiliates you know, in uh, the Urban League affiliate group. And so Project Ready is a uh, program that um, um, provides you know, kids you know, with opportunity for a couple of pathways, either a pathway to college, a pathway to work, or a pathway to the military. And so we do job readiness um, training to expose kids you know, to various career opportunities uh, in various industries. And um, we talk to them about you know, college and how to get prepared you know, for college and what to expect when you get to college, you know, and those types of things and stuff. Right, the so program is two separate. A young person will either be in the music program or the sports program. Exactly. Oh, unless they are what we call them student musician athlete. So I, I deal with student athletes. My nephew, which is Kerry, was a co-founder. He actually played college ball and he's a professional mu musician. So again, our programs are really based on getting the kids interested. So right. you're, you're at a stage where you're finding what, what they love. So we're really trying to we create the relationship, tap into the passion, and as the skill develops. So when you first in it, no matter what age you are, we're not really as focused on some of the details that we would be as they were split off. So somebody like Mr. Frazier, who went to college on a football scholarship, but he went on in music. So he played football to pay his way through school, but he is a professional can, musician. I'm just trying to understand a young person's time. They could, spend, they could spend in it. They, they could go back and they forth could go back and forth. and forth. They could. Okay. And we actually have some students who are doing that now. Um, well, but yes, we do okay. have some students that okay. are doing that now. Okay. And so this is a picture of um, some kids that we took to South Africa. So each year we take um, a group of children out of the country. And our relationship with Tennessee State University's Office of International Affairs, which is what I have the honor and privilege of serving as well, we align our um, secondary education program to our college program. So wherever we, my office takes a group of college students, we take our secondary education students and we work with them on fundraising and friend raising and we find STEAM opportunities for them. So it's either science, technology, engineering, arts, or math and then there's a sports component which we just found out that the Department of State um, in Washington DC is now going to give me some money to do the sports program then we can incorporate the sports piece into our international initiatives but this this these types of activities become a carrot for the kids so they know they have something to work towards they know that they have to meet some benchmarks they have to continue to work hard to get these opportunities and it has truly been life-changing so some of the kids that have been in our program for a while were since our inception they will actually have more stamps on their passports than college so of our college students and it gives them an opportunity just to see how actually fortunate they are here in the United States when they visit places like Soweto uh, in South Africa and continuing to surround them with professionals, professional musicians, professional artists, whatever the case may be, it gives them that sense of hope, it gives them that sense of belonging, uh, it empowers them to do more than just sit on the corner and do things and think of things that they, they should not uh, be thinking of. These two pictures here are when Corey took a group of kids to, uh, we worked with the National Sports Authority, which is saw Monica Park and upstairs, and you did the, tell them about the tour that you so, did. So, um, the GoPro tour is basically, every time we go speak to kids and we ask them what they want to be, 90% of the time it's a professional athlete, a professional entertainer, something very artistic or, or creative. And, uh, uh, the thing with the GoPro Tour, it was about showing them all of the sides of a particular industry. So uh, when we went to see the Nashville Sounds, uh, we went to Bridgestone, they were able to talk to the presidents of these organizations and find out what these people did in college, what did they have to do, is this what you want to do when you grew up? And so they were able to see all the different ways that you could be a part of a particular industry, especially if you love football. You know, you're just one play away from being, not being a football player. And so my uh, our opportunity to take them to see these places, they were able to see that there are more sides uh, to the game than just on the field and, and, and as, a, as an athlete. So that's what that whole component is about. And uh, one, 
very, very, very humble, but the, the, he is more important to my program, I think, than I am at times because the most important thing I tell the kids is self-control and where he comes in with his knowledge and skill related to martial arts. That is like the most important thing. So self-control is one of the main things in a child, being able to control themselves in a high-intensity situation, de-escalate a situation, get themselves out of a situation in the, in the end, potentially have to protect themselves. But again, the main thing is self-control and being able to manipulate the situation. Uh, so I thought that was a very important point I wanted to make. And then, Tim, you were going to tell them about the seven intellects that they learned throughout the program? Well, part of the self-control is to is self-confidence and, and believing in yourself. And in order to believe in yourself, you have to know who you are. Well, let's start with the seven intellects that make you become a whole, complete person and work towards making you become a whole, complete person. And those seven intellects begin with the cognitive. How, what do you think about? The linguistic, what are you speaking? What positive things are you speaking you know, in your life about yourself? Or what do you know about yourself? Then we deal with the emotional part of your, your human anatomy, your, um, your, uh, your emotional, your social, your physical, financial, and your spiritual. Not necessarily as uh, a religious or uh, your religious belief, but what's your hope? What's your goal? What's your aspiration? And how do you get there? Again, that all reflects on yourself and your self-control. So we teach those those things. And what was um, um, also quite troubling uh, many times, but this we just did our um, performance in the juvenile detention center about three weeks ago, and um, the kids they're they're given journals to write the lyrics into um, you know into these journals, and so Kerry told the audience he said. You know, the schools tell us that these kids can't read, read and they can't write. Well, here's the proof. These are three journals that each one of those kids had full of lyrics. And when you opened them up, the kids were writing. They had impeccable writing. They actually are sitting there writing out the lyrics and expressing themselves. And so I went up to one of the kids and I was like, you know, if you had to change one thing in your life other than being in here, what would it be? And he said, the way that I was raised. And they have no control over that. So it takes organizations like From the Heart to enter into their space and to show them that we genuinely care and that everything that we do is really from the heart. Then we partner with outstanding, you know, uh, long-standing organizations like the Urban League to help bring in those additional resources to help us get, you know, get the work done. As far as the budget narrative, um, that's just giving an idea of what the, the money is being spent on, of course. Uh, paying the stipends to the individuals who are, you know, doing the work, the boots on the ground, um, paying for supplies that we need, like the sheet music, uh, the, the sporting equipment and things like that, uh, participating in some of the uh, meetings and, and conferences and things, that's a mileage request. We will actually pay for the insurance through uh, the organization that we already have. And then, of course, we will be paying for tutoring services because oftentimes those kids' parents ask us for tutoring services. And then uh, Clifton Harris and his group will be donating um, the Project Ready work on Saturday. So that's just like a summary of the budget, and I know you'll have questions about that. Um, as it relates to sustainability, we have numerous community partners who engage with us. Um, we have the local groups like the universities, uh, TSU, Belmont, um, Vanderbilt, the community colleges, Nashville State Community College. We've already set up college tours for some of those. Uh, community advocacy, of course. Um, we are working very diligently on expanding our reach to other community partners and helping us to advocate for programs such as uh, what we're doing and then, of course, involving the local government, uh, continuing to work with the juvenile court, uh, accepting referrals, and I'm trying to write as many grant proposals as I can to bring in more funding so we can provide more service to more students. How do you get your refer? How would you be getting your referrals from juvenile court? 
the well, I guess it's through juvenile court to the schools. Okay. So the schools, because of their restorative practices, mm -hmm. they know that the kids who are borderline or have just gotten out of juvenile court who are now back into the schools, mm -hmm. and they want that extra support for them to keep them out of trouble. We also worked with Chance Light or Spectrum. I don't know if you all have heard of it. Yeah. Um, last year we had a contract with them, and there was a lot of going back and forth dealing with the police and the arrests and all of those types of things, and just trying to keep the kids engaged. And we were heard that when we don't show up at Juvenile Detention Center, there are issues. They want that mobile studio. They want those opportunities to be able to creatively express the things that's going on with them because they have, they feel they have no other way to do that. So we, we, we really appreciate that relationship with Yolanda Hockett and the group down there. Um, this is just some data that we know that, you know, 80% of our youth are participating in some form of enrichment activities. Um, we, are, we work intentionally with them on peaceful conflict resolution and ultimately vi violence reduction, keeping them from fighting and giving them alternatives to that. We are extremely proud of the outcomes. Um, we track the information through the schools and they're telling us that the kids that are in our program have 75% less discipline referrals and a 98% attendance rating because they know we're going to check, they know we're going to ask, they know that I might just show up. So um, we're really excited about that. 85% of the students in our program are able to articulate a better belief in themselves, as Tim was talking about, because so many of our kids don't know who they are. They're being influenced by external media, friends, or whatever. So uh, our work really helps them with that. And then 70% of the students will be offered employment with the help of the Urban League, with the help of the Mayor's Office and the Opportunity Now program. We actually doubled the number of students that will be in Opportunity Now this year, so we're just uber excited about everything. 70% um, of our students will take the pre-ACT and SAT after the first year in our program, and now that we have the Urban League, that's going to be even um, better opportunity for us. And of course, we just want to end with love, integrity, faith, and education. That's what we consider life. And again, not faith being the religious type of faith, but that faith in yourself, that belief in yourself. And if that's kind of modeling the Maslow's hierarchy, but those kids need their basic physiological needs met first. They need to feel safe. Then they want to feel loved and uh, that they belong to somebody or something. And then they have that self-esteem and they feel self-actualized. And so that's from the heart. So questions? In your budget, the 15-5 that you show us, your, your portion of the, the program, what's the source of those revenues? Grants. Grants. Mm -hmm. And do you all currently operate, I was reading through this near to here, a summer music program? Yes. Um, OK. And a, a, sports program. And sports program, OK. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers. Um, I was just curious, you cite numbers for 2016 and through 2016, I assume the 2017? No, it is. I just numbers, stopped it. I mean, are they about the same number? No, no, 2017 was more. We keep increasing every year. So last year it was 40 as far as domestic students, and then of course we bring in the students from the other countries. Okay. Now, if they are in the juvenile detention center, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when they get out, if that's not a stipulation in their probation or whatever, we definitely want to encourage that. Mm -hmm. Kerry actually took his passport into the detention center uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they were amazed because they had never seen a passport before. And he talked to them about what you can do if you just get it together. I will say I, will say I have heard very positive things about the work y'all do. Back in detention, we should close. Oh. We, you know, just um, uh, we hear from you know the workers, and and uh, of course, you know, the, our contract monitor is uh, well, yeah, Miss Williams, um, who um, 
uh, you know, just to make sure that, you know, we, they're doing what we, you know, uh, have uh, asked them to do. And uh, but she's also told me something about that. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, we, we have our good things about what you're doing back there. Oh, well, great. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your assistance. We want to do more. We want to do more. And to that point, you know, that is why they originally decided you know, to join you know, in partnership you know, with uh, on the heart. Um, because we're trying to move you know, to being an intermediary organization and not so programmatic, you know, but help those organizations that are doing good work because we recognize there are way too many nonprofits out here doing the same thing, you know, of duplication. But the consistency and the actual results is a whole nother thing, and this is the organization that I found you know, that was actually doing it. You know, so I'm proud you not know, to put the Urban League name you know, on, on this partnership. Let me ask everyone's least favorite question. She didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> this is everyone's least favorite question. We have $500,000 in requests from 11 organizations, all of whom are doing terrific work. If we can't fully fund the 50, what can you all do? We're going to continue what we've been doing, because we're doing it now. What will this look like if you were to not get the full 50? It'd just be smaller, because it's, at this point, you know, the foundation of what we do is relationship-oriented. Uh, the director, who was internationally traveled, bilingual, and the whole nine, he lives in Levy Place. My wife and family are in Columbus, Ohio. I'm back in, in Fort Worth. One of the reasons we were, I was heavy at the, at the uh, juvenile detention center for the sports, but wasn't able to do it because of the because of the uh, lack of funding. And I'm going back and forth. And so we going we are going to max the opportunity. So you know whatever that is, we're going to we're going to push and use it because it's about the kids. And so we, we're small foundation. We started with. No money in None. first two or three years, no money, and somebody dropped in and donated a check one morning. We were doing bus stop morning motivation, which is we decided to open up the facility two hours before the kids had to be on the bus to go to school. And so, you know, the money is necessary, but it's never been a deterrent uh, for us to to do what we're capable of doing and doing the work for them. And that's a good kids. question that you asked, you know, Ryan, because I asked Jules the same thing. And, um, and and quite honestly, you know, it's a matter of scale, having to scale back and mm -hmm. not serve as many kids so that the kids that you do scale back to still have the same experience. You know, but with the, we, we would hope, you know, that, that the complete funding would allow us, you know, to, to serve the number of kids, you know, that we're asking to to sir we're projecting to sir thank you any closing thought thank you all very much well, we thank we appreciate you appreciate the privilege of your time thank you thank you thank you, thank you all we appreciate it thank you for your time I'm Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. I'm Jim Swack. I'm a juvenile court administrator of juvenile court. Adrian Carlin, director of juvenile detention. <clears throat> so, are we ready? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we're here. Um, if you can go to the first slide. Um, my name is Kara Johnson. I'm sorry. I'm with the Fine Design. I'm the executive director. No, I'm Jeff Schicks. I'm the executive director with Youth for Christ. I'm Sharice Chapman. I'm the program director with the Fine Design. <clears throat> so in looking at uh, this first slide with some of the truancy suspensions and arrests, we do know that uh, Metro Schools scored about three quarters of MS students sc scored below grade average in the state testing uh, between grades three through eight, which is part of our target age group. We also have seen, uh, even though we've seen a decrease in arrests and violent crime in juveniles, we've seen an increase in the younger uh, students that are committing the more serious crimes. And so, therefore, that's one of the reasons that we look at some of the demographics as well as the schools that we are trying to reach with our grant proposal. 
Oh, the history of Youth for Christ? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the history of Youth for Christ were a chapter that originated here in the Nashville area in 1976. Uh, Youth for Christ was started by Billy, Dr. Billy Graham uh, in the 1940s, 1944 to be exact. And through the assemblies and the, and the, the big uh, events that he did, that's how we became part of our chapter here with the Nashville branch starting in 1976. Uh, currently, we are doing programming in middle schools and high schools in 22 schools across Davison, Williamson, Rutherford, and Sumner counties, pr primarily in Davison, where we have 22 schools. With our Parent Life Program, our Campus Life Program, we have a Juvenile Justice Ministry that's in JDC, as well as the Women's Facility and, and Boys Facility out in the Hermitage area. And then our uh, City Life Program works through community centers such as Rocket Town, uh, Napier Community Center, and Harvest Hands and a couple other community centers in the area. Okay. Um, so as you can see, um, Jeff gave you a little background of just the need of this program. Um, we really focus on not only violence, but truancy. Um, if you look at statistics, almost every violent offender started off being truant from school. So we really, really want to not only be in intervene, but we also want to be proactive in starting to see those initial signs of um, challenging behaviors with truancy. Um, Shelly, if you can move to the next slide. <clears throat> so we're really, really excited about this program that we will be proposing today, the Down Plan the Drama program. And there's definitely pun intended, and you'll see in just a second. <laughs> so this particular program, you'll hear us call it DTD as well, um, it's centered around conflict, conflict violence, and, I'm sorry, conflict resolution, as well as just bringing overall peace to the community. What it does is it uses an innovative approach that really focuses on preventing um, through a hands-on theater method called Drama for Conflict Transformation. So you'll hear a, a, us talk a lot about DCT as well. Um, it has adopted the USA's Youth Development Model Framework, which allows us to engage youth, families, communities, and even governments so youth are empowered to reach their full potential. Now what this looks like is short plays, they are trained on conflict in four different ways. So we look to analyze conflict, not only just externally, because a lot of times we think of external conflict, but internally as well, looking at those behaviors that cause risky behavior and juvenile interaction. <clears throat> we also look at preventing any conflict, the negative conflict that happens, how can we prevent that particular conflict? We also look at once you have conflict, how can you resolve that conflict? And we also look at leading and engagement. So what this program does, it, it, it uses short plays and presents it to the community in interactive performances. So for example, it will show an audience what a negative consequence look like and a positive consequence look like. And it allows the audience to engage in those solutions. <clears throat> That's the next slide. So um, this framework focuses on four improvement areas. Those areas are assets, agency, contribution, and enabling environment. So what assets looks like is that the, that's the actual training and the skills and the resources that the young people will receive weekly. And we'll break that down in just a second. Um, that drama for conflict training, <clears throat> that social emotional learning, which looks like recognizing emotions, interpersonal um, skills, as well as something like self-control. So what it takes is the assets and moves it to an agency. So what agencies means is that how can you take what we gave you in training and resources and use it in cognitive development and use it as another way of thinking. So what that looks like is the ability to think ahead. So we know in this culture now, we, we are instant, we think instantly, and we see that trend with young people. So this training allows them to actually think of the consequences when they're having an engagement and an interaction. Um, also, positive belief and future. What blows my mind is the amount of kids that come through our program that would tell us, I would be dead by the time I'm 18. So without any type of hope, they don't look to do anything with their life. They're not even trying to, you know, really utilize their potential. So what we, we do 
is make sure that they have a positive belief in their future. And if they, we can give them hope, we can give them um, the tools to make sure that they, um, they have success. Contribution, um, so you have your assets, which is the skills, you have your agency, which is your different way of thinking once you receive those tools, and then you have contribution, which takes those skills and train an audience of people in what conflict prevention and resolution looks like. So being hands-on, engaging the audience, again, letting them pick if they want to see a negative consequence first or a positive consequence first. And then last but not least, it looks at improving um, the environment. So that's that trauma-informed practices that we utilize to make sure that they have a safe space, not only physically, but emotionally, um, mentally, and again, physical as well, and bonding with each other within the program and within the community. So the program structure that we'll be looking at, so most of our program is gender-based programming, either emphasizing the girls or the boys. This one will be the girls. We will be focused on the southeast area of Nashville, the Antioch area. Sometimes they are lacking in a lot of different services, so we definitely want to focus in on that area. Most of our referrals, by them being children, naturally, we go where the children are. So that's the schools and, unfortunately, juvenile court. They're often referred to us due to um, school suspensions being high, truancy, their attendance not being the best. Um, their interaction naturally with juvenile court would be our juvenile court referrals and just overall risky behaviors. And so the activities that will take place during that week to incorporate those um, principles that Kara spoke about, we will have weekly sessions with the children. They usually range from like an hour to two hours, depending on um, the availability within the schools or at juvenile court. And so during that time, we'll focus on those issues like conflict resolution, anger management, positive behaviors. Um, but we know they're children, so they don't always want to just sit and talk. So we want to get them out and expose them to things that maybe normally they would not be. Um, so they will take um, different enrichment trips. They'll have that opportunity. Um, and by us doing the DCT, we will try to also incorporate um, things that will enhance that drama piece, going to theater, seeing plays, and things of that nature so they can learn um, from actually seeing that in action. Each participant will be paired up with an adult mentor. So not only will the adult mentor work on acting techniques, but that gives an opportunity to have that adult-child relationship as well, which a lot of our students do not have in their home setting. Um, and in addition to us feeding into the children, the end result would be that um, the big production at the end. So that will feed back into the community to give that community also some hope and some other insight on how they too can deal with conflict and peaceful resolutions and believing that this generation can do it a different way than what we've currently seen. Um, and follow up. So we are. Um, each student will have a customized goal plan. We want the children, even after the program, to have a goal set for themselves, short-term, long-term goals, and assist them in achieving those said goals, and have a accountability partner, for lack of a better word, to help them achieve those goals. Okay, and this um, would touch on a lot of what Sharice just talked about. This is our evaluation plan and our logic model. So we already talked about the needs um, of, of the community, it will, how it will focus on, I don't know if we talked about middle school and high school um, young ladies, um, and we talked about the different um, ways that they will be brought into the program. We know that just doing our research that we, it seems like there's a lot of similar programs, but what makes us stand out is number one, we're specifically focusing on conflict resolution skills, anger management, violence reduction in our programming. We also are intentional in hiring and um, uh, retrieving volunteers are, are relatable. I think we underestimate relatability in programming. So making sure that it's some relatability 
there. Um, the fun part is they will also be coached in acting. So just big picture, we're thinking about just acting, but we're talking about skills that are gained within production, within technical support, which within makeup, with, within costumes. So they'll get skills and be able to do all of that. It won't just be the acting piece that we will focus on. Uh, we really want to stir up some passions in them. So our inputs, how we um, really measure the program, we'll look at how many trainings are done, weekly workshops, how many um, participants will be matched with coaches is what we're calling them, the community engagement piece. During this pilot, we're looking at doing one production because this will be the first pilot year. However, we're hoping to incorporate this in more of a, a monthly interactive production that we can show to the community. Also, case management. I have appendices that I'll be um, handing out to you, so you just kind of look at what our case management looks like, our goal plan, the specifics behind what we're going to be working on while they're in the 15-week program, um, specifically and intentionally. So our um, immediate outcomes look like social support. We talked about that coaching and mentoring. And what that looks like is 30 minutes to an hour after the session is over, they'll get to meet with their coaches on site after the program. Um, interpersonal skills, we are intentional about increasing school time. So we want to make sure that we decrease truancy and decrease behavior referrals. Again, that goes that positive beliefs about one future. If we can get hope into them, we can get them started in passion. We can get them committed to the program. Um, avoiding risky behaviors is another um, uh, immediate outcome and em just overall emotional responses. Um, our long-term outcome is high school graduation. If we keep them in school, we can get them to graduate. We talked about gaining skills, not just acting skills and leadership skills, but also those skills in production and things of that nature that I spoke about. Um, a long-term outcome is nonviolent, peaceful responses. Um, they just don't know how to respond sometimes to conflict, so we want to be intentional about get, getting their mindset and their cognitive development um, completed. No juvenile interaction. A huge exciting one for me is leadership and advocacy, giving them a voice to be able to speak for themselves and positive, healthy um, behaviors. Um, some of the evaluation tools, and again, this will be in your appendix, is a, um, ACE child, I'm sorry, average child experiences. Um, we average about six to seven anyway um, in our programming. Um, Metro National Public Schools currently provides us with a monthly data report that shows us academics, behavior referrals, suspensions, um, attendance, and even test scores. So we get that now anyway, so we will continue to get that data report. Um, one of the assessments, that pre-assessments that we will be doing in post is the California Healthy Kids Assessment, which really gives us a deep dive into the data of what we're dealing with and, and the best case scenario of putting them on a path of success with their action plan. And also pre and post surveys and exit um, interviews. So your okay. sessions was, will be at juvenile court and in the schools? Yes, we currently do that now. Yeah, I know you yes. do the fine yes. design mm -hmm. at the court. Yes, okay. so we've already made. The good thing about this program, this is an a enhancement to our current program. They were mm -hmm. already doing production. We wanted to find a specific curriculum that we could really use to enhance the program. So we've already made the initial connections, and we've already in the schools now. Okay. So um, we've done a lot of the legwork already. And again, we'll kind of go over that in just a second. So I just wanted to give you a background of this program. So this is not a brand new program. It is here in Nashville. But this program, the original idea was for youth in countries that had war and they were seeing violence. And what they were showing is that those young people were internalizing, seeing that war, and started to act out themselves. So if we, we can't call you violence a war. I don't know what it is. We have our drug on war, but I think we, we definitely have a war on, on youth violence as well, just nationwide. So we looked at the curriculum, we looked at the outcomes, which is also displayed in your appendix, and it was just amazing to see the young people. We're all visual people, so to, for them to actually be a part of the solution and seeing what conflict is um, and how we can lead to um, negative past was amazing, the data. This has the potential of being incorporated in, in long-term institutions, so getting this um, up and running in a pilot 
find that it can be brought to drama clubs, to juvenile detention, to churches, and in interactive plays. Um, currently, 284 youth are trained um, in different countries globally. There have been 33 programs that have launched this DCT um, Drama for Conflict Transformation model. I mean, you saw huge gains in leadership skills, interpersonal skills, conflict, anger management, peaceful um, solutions, and even a decrease in social anxiety. And I brought that up because in Antioch, we have to remember, it has been two mass shootings in 12 months in Antioch, this, the anxiety level is, is, is off the roof. So we, we wanted to be intentional about not only addressing conflict, but just overall anxiety, which leads to conflict in the community. <clears throat> and one last thing, the staff that are administering this program have already been trained with the, the ACE uh, indicators training, too, from the probation office. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, go back. I'm sorry. We were okay. Um, so, just to kind of briefly go over the program uh, staff. So, as you can see from some of the photos, it's um, a small team but a mighty team. So, um, as far as the program management, that's myself. We have um, two youth coordinators and a case manager, and then our program oversight. But our main um, staff base are volunteers. We're always looking for volunteers to help us further our mission. Okay, this is our program financial model. The overall cost of the program is 127000 As you can see, 13% of that is from individual and corporate fu um, fi uh, funding. Um, grants and foundation is 13%. Um, this is a, a good chunk of our, the program, which is 33%. We do receive program revenue, not on, from the productions we will receive revenue, but also contracted services, which Metro Schools now contract our services. So we do get funding from them, and also 18% in-kind donation. Um, the program cost is 32%, and the 68% is salaries. And you can see I kind of put some of our other funders up there. We're funded by Maddox, Metro School, Edge Hill Partnership, and the Women's Fund. So as far as the timeline, uh, we start our planning, naturally we're planning and strategizing all year long, but to focus on the school year, we start that after um, our summer programming. And so that would be that July, August time frame. We start to, well the schools start to recruit and refer um, students during um, that August, September. So we give them um, part of that first nine weeks to kind of identify students that might be able to benefit from programming such as this. And then, um, so around the September, October timeframe, depending on the school and the need and when we can start, we start the programming and we take that all the way through the school year until around uh, spring break time. And so at the end of that, that's when they will have their final production graduation ceremony. Um, in addition to that, so as Kara mentioned earlier, we do pre and post surveys from the children's standpoint. So we definitely always want to hear their voice. And 100% of them from our previous years have said they've had issues with their anger and their anger getting them into trouble. But by the end of the programming, not that the anger goes away, because we all get angry, but they're able to better deal with it. They have determined different triggers and things of that nature, and just better ways to look at different things. When you, um, as Kara mentioned earlier, when you have hope and you're not dealing with so many other things, you want to do better, and you want to go to school, and you want to achieve. So all those things kind of tie in together. Now, we can't solve all of their problems, but to make it easier for them to deal with the issues that they have is our focus and our goal. 
I really wanted to um, just give you a little background on this too. This is our current, as it state now, this is the results of our programming. So we will be able to, at minimum, decrease truancy by 50%, if not eliminate it altogether. Um, uh, 90%, I'm sorry, 80% knew how to deal with their anger um, post the program. And they were, they were bad. They said they knew how to deal with it better. 90% before did not know how to calm themselves down. 90% knew how to calm themselves down. And this is one that I just I love to death. 100% of our participants said they were just happier as a result of the program. I don't think we ask our kids if they're happy anymore. So it's just it's awesome to know that they're happier as a result of the program. Um, I also gave you a pendant to just later on if you want to look through it just to get more specific. But Sharice is going to talk about our overall impact. And so the overall impact, we want to increase positive behaviors. We want at least 90% of the kids to have an increase um, posit in positive behavior areas, whether that be nonviolent or peaceful responses to conflict, um, reduced or no incidents at all with illegal behavior. We want to increase those interpersonal skills and a higher order of thinking, you know, um, that critical thinking piece. I have children myself, and so I know that even sometimes with them, that critical thinking piece is lacking. And so we want to help kind of bring that back. Um, and also 90% will have a de decrease in behavioral referrals in schools and suspensions. Um, I know that that is an, uh, an issue that, you know, that is plagued with our children, and so we want to help them reduce that. Um, improve relationships. I know we live in a society where uh, your Facebook friends are your friends, but we know that's not reality. So we definitely <laughs> want to help these kids build face-to-face -face relationships and bond um, with their peers, bond with healthy um, adult, you know, adults who provide healthy relationships, things of that nature. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, 90% would show an increase in positive beliefs in their futures. We want these kids to have hope. A lot of them just do not have any. And I know myself, I struggle when I look at TV and the news to have hope. And so we want them to know that, especially for them, there'll be that change. You know, a lot of us are weaning ourselves off, but they will be that change and they can be that change. Um, and so the overall impact is not just for the kids, but it's for our community and our society as a whole. I think we need something for us all to hope for. And these kids are our future, period. It just is what it is. And so we need to set a tone that's different from what we see every day. And I think these babies are the best way to do that for all of us. Yeah, I have. Yeah, um, I just wanted to point out Miss Cynthia on the slide, and this is why we really, we were intentional about looking for programming that the kids were asking for. We were doing a semi-production anyway, but it wasn't a formal curriculum. That was just something that came on, came up with it on their own. And so last year during the production, this young lady um, just had went through a lot in her life, really didn't have a voice. And in the middle of graduation, when it was almost over, she walked to the stage and was like, I want to talk. And so I stopped the program for her, brought, brought her on stage. We have a, we have a, we have your back mentality. So you see my hands kind of holding her up because I could feel her shaking. But to be able to see somebody who did not have a voice whisper when she talked, you could actually hear her on the outside of the hallway. It was amazing. And she just talked about how her life had changed because of this program. So that's the goal is not only just making stuff sound good, but actually having impactful programming that can show these kids that they do have a future. Q&A time. Articulate for me the partnership between Fine Design and Youth for Christ. Mm -hmm. So currently we, we are in a collaboration called Hearts, which is helping to elevate and restore Tennessee streets. And what we do is collaborate on programming and events. So currently we have came together and partnered on actual programming as it states. So for example, um, we, we bring our funding together, our resources, and we actually do the program together. 
And so our volunteers with Youth for Christ also volunteer with the Flight and Design Program and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So as you know, it's out of interest, I mean, this is not, this has been a test. For example, as you all put together um, your good balance of funding for um, downplaying the drama, do both organizations bring resources to that? Yes. 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 Okay. So funding comes through, um, it will come through for you for Christ and to the fine design. Um, they provide also in-kind donations, um, for example, snacks and things of that nature, but their resources come into the programs as well. Yes. Okay. Just for clarity's sake, the, the great organizations that are working with you all, Maddox, mm -hmm. the Women's Fund and Community Foundation, are both of you all the recipients of those grants, or is it Youth for Christ the recipient? The Fine Design is the recipient. Fine Design, okay. Yes. Okay. yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, mm -hmm. will this grant allow you to serve 50 more female youth? No, so this will be 50 youth, um, females in general, okay. as, as the pilot, yes. And you focused in the uh, Antioch Yes, area. south area. Um, we saw that the south and the east precinct had the most arrests in all, um, so with 800 arrests with young people. So ours is focused on the south with emphasis on Antioch, which is in the south. And these will be students that we may not be reaching in our current programs. Mm -hmm. okay. To a little bit more clarity to your yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Are y'all currently, uh, you know, at what you're doing now, are you getting you get, uh, referrals from our MSAC? Yes, program? yes, yes, we do okay. get okay. Okay. referrals from MSAC. So that's uh, part of that juvenile court, so we get them from uh, the POs as well as MSAC. Yeah, right. For both of us. Yeah. Just right away. Mm -hmm. right. Everyone's least favorite question. We've got $500,000 of requests from 11 top-notch organizations. <laughs> If indeed, and this is not to prejudice, there's no decision anywhere made yet, even <laughs> talked about. If indeed you were to receive less than $50,000 from us, what impact does that have? Could, any, could this be done in any form or fashion with less money? Yes, it can definitely be done. With a, that's, we may have to reduce the number of kids, but the program would still exist. If I, I'm not, I think I'm. No, you're answering my okay, question. Okay. I mean, obviously, yes. I mean, obviously so now, if you get the 50, you've got 70 plus thousand dollars committed to it as well. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, if, for example, we can't fully fund everybody's proposal, there are different answers. Mm -hmm. Some people can't do it unless mm -hmm. they get it all from us. Mm -hmm. Others can do it in proportionally if they get less money. Yes, it would be in proportion. Yes, yeah. it would be in. Proportion. Portion. We will reduce the numbers, unfortunately, no, but we, 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 the program will okay. stand, yes. But also based on the ability for us as a, a pilot program to see the needs and how that's being addressed to the community, if as Youth for Christ and speaking for our organization, we would possibly try to look at other areas to pull funding from something different. Uh, in order to make, if this program is a successful pilot, to put those into that place. We have a great relationship as partners. Mm -hmm. We have uh, for the last five, six years. Uh, and it's cr and the, it's crucial for this year, especially getting it up and running, but what the goal is, is to be sustainable by our, our performances. We, uh, if you look at other areas of this program, um, they are sustaining their organization by the, the performances, so that initial, one is so important, uh, but long term, we will have other um, financials coming in from that aspect. Mm -hmm. You want to sum up anyway? We, we are, I think, done with our questions. Uh, we're just excited for this opportunity. I think if you actually see the kids that come from the areas that we have, being able to get on stage and and act it out, one one of the ideas is getting getting some of the juvenile detention stories and actually acting those stories out, looking at what the negative outcome could be, and also providing a positive. But I think if you can just see what they can do, it's truly amazing. Amazing, and we just appreciate your time and this opportunity today as well. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. This group is National Peacemakers. You're in session and you may make your introduction. Hi, I'm Cindy. Well, well, let us tell you who we are first. Oh, my Because you, you get to run the show after that. That's right. I'm Ronnie Stein and I'm in the mayor's office. I'm Margie Davis, retired juvenile court employee. 
I'm uh, Jim Swack. I'm a deputy court administrator at Juvenile Court. Okay. Adrian Carl is the director of Juvenile Detention Center. I'm Cindy Montano. I am currently on the board as a service treasurer for Nashville Peacemakers, and I'm also um, the program director for Back to Basics, which is our foundational program, the one that we've had the longest. And this is? My name is Sterling, Sterling Wright. Uh, I'm just going, I'm myself, so my name is Sterling like in silver because I like to shine. Uh, they call me Mr. 100. I grew up in South Nashville. And thank y'all for taking time out to see us today. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we did prepare a, a PowerPoint, but I have a handout because um, I'm not real adept at okay. changing slides and keeping myself on the point. So <laughs> all right. mm -hmm. we sometimes it's, it's easier <laughs> if we have all the, the notes sure. right here. So um, just a brief introduction on Nashville Peacemakers. We have been around since 2003. Um, our mission is twofold, to give youth in distressed neighborhoods the basic life skills and self-worth to choose peaceful alternatives to violence, and also to support the mothers whose children have been victimized. Um, as I mentioned a few moments ago, my name is Cindy Montano. I'm a board member and the program director for Back to Basics. A um, little timeline here of my involvement, um, well, my background professionally as well as my involvement with Nashville Peacemakers. For uh, 20 some odd years, I was an independent film producer in Nashville, owned my own production company called uh, Alternative Visions, and also worked with a number of the large production houses in Nashville. So from 2012 until currently, I am the CEO of Matlock Endoscopic. It's a business that my husband and I have owned for almost 30 years. And um, at a certain point in time, it just made sense for me to bring my skill set over, which is dollars and details, into our business and you know make a go with that. I met Clemmy in 2005 at the Nashville Film Festival. Um, knew at that point in time that I would reconnect with her at some point in time. 2000, in 2007, two years later, I began volunteering with Nashville Peacemakers. She and I reconnected through a documentary project that I was doing on homelessness in Nashville. She was at the Nashville Homeless Power Project at the time. I stepped into the role of volunteering with Nashville Peacemakers as her webmaster, and in 2012 um, came onto the board, really came in full force with her, and she describes me as her ride or die within the program. Um, in 2014, I began serving as a treasurer in an official board capacity. In 2017, when Clemmy um, had some health issues going on and underwent her um, heart transplant, I came in and took over the, as the director of the Back to Basics program. So I'd like to give you just a little background on the Back to Basics program. Um, so well, I guess 25 years as an independent film producer and 12 years as CEO of Matlock Endoscopic, I bring the heart of a storyteller and the soul of an entrepreneur to, Mat to Nashville Peacemakers. And for many years, my main focus was fiscal and fiduciary. Um, but now, since I've stepped into as Back to Basics as the program director, I've discovered my life's purpose in helping young ladies navigate in towards in, to their life purpose. Um, and that program, the life skills program that we have for girls age 12 to 17 is the Back to Basics program. And in that program, I have seen such a difference, a difference on purpose. We do everything on purpose, for purpose because our goal, our, our job is to lead these kids towards their purpose. So just some brief metrics on the Back to Basics program. 80% of the girls who are currently in the program have been with us for 18 months or longer. Um, we are a fundable organization. Last year we received a grant to train the girls and run a 5K, which they did. Um, this year we received the same grant for the Back, for, uh, back to Basic Fitness. Um, we're doing a program called Becoming a Confident Swimmer. So I have 10 young ladies ages 12 to 15 who have never been swimmers, who are becoming swimmers. Um, in that program, um, 
or prior to starting that program, we did a survey with our parents, and 100% of the parents interviewed or surveyed responded true to the statement that Back to Basics is helping my daughter develop social, emotional, and intellectual tools to help her create a positive vision for her life. 100% of the parents replied to that. Um, we have three sets of sisters in the program, and the mothers of those three sets of sisters have all spoken to me that not only am I mentoring their daughters, not only is Nashville Peacemakers mentoring their daughters, we are also mentoring the, them as the mothers. So now you've got a family dynamic being impacted, uh, siblings who are waiting to come up into the program. And you know, I mentioned the swim program that we're doing right now. Um, Several of the parents have asked us, would we consider applying for a grant to help them to learn how to swim so that they can now participate in swimming with their daughters? Now we've changed the whole family dynamic. So I think that grant has pretty much written itself for this year. Um, then equally impressive and also different on purpose is our Mothers Over Murder program. Um, which currently serves over 30 mothers who have lost a child, mostly sons, to violence. And as of last, uh, our last meeting, we had three fathers join the, the group and a promise for more at this week's meeting, which will be on Thursday, because men also grieve when they lose a child to violence, but there's nothing currently available for dads that does what the mom program does for the mom. So we've decided now that MOM, doesn't just stand for Mothers Over Murder, it stands for Misters Over Murder as well. And the third pillar program of Nashville Peacemakers is our Straight Talk program. It's similar to our Back to Basics program, but it's geared towards boys ages 12 to 17. And it is one of the only programs available for boys in the 37208 zip code before they get in trouble. And that is, again, being different on purpose. Um, we also have siblings involved in straight talk. We have brothers and sisters who are involved both in back to basics and straight talk. So with these two pillar programs, we are really impacting family dynamic. Um, and also our three programs have, get, have garnered the confidence of various departments within the city. Um, when it comes to addressing youth violence. We were one of the, the first grassroots organizations to receive the, um, the grant from the mayor's office to uh, address youth violence. MDHA is currently referring people to our Mothers Over Murder program, and social workers from Metro Nashville, Metro Nashville Public Schools are referring kids to both our Back to Basics and Straight Talk program. So we, 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 we've gained confidence within various departments within the city. And so this new program, which we haven't come up with a really cool name for it yet, but we will, I'm leaning towards the spot for a number of reasons that I don't need to go into right now. But it's a natural progression of what we're already doing. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to increase the number of programs that are available to boys between the ages of 12 and 17 within the, the communities that we serve. Um, and with all of our youth programs, our goal is we design them to save these kids before they need rescue, catch them before they get caught up in the system, and that requires opportunity and exposure. Uh, so in keeping with opportunity and exposure, they're going to be exposed to, to Sterling Wright, who, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I haven't been flipping around real okay. real well in this. But Sterling, I'll let him tell you a little bit about himself, but I'm going to brag on him for a minute. He, he was a con contestant on Hell's Kitchen. He has been a personal chef to CEOs and um, celebrity rappers, including Vanilla Ice. And he was raised in the J.C. Napier Public Housing. And like so many people that are part of the team, the leadership team and the directorship team of Nashville Peacemakers. He is bringing 
his heart and soul that came out of that community back to that community. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sterling to talk about the cooking program. All right. I'm going to ask y'all to do me a favor and close your eyes. Because as I'm talking, I'm going to paint this picture and give you this vision. I know I'm here for a reason. I'm a guy that grew up in J.C. Napier who they said wasn't going to make it. The devil told me everything was impossible. I go to this show where the meanest man on TV fall in love with me, become the fan favorite, the odds of that. It went from impossible to I'm possible. So you get around, you get these job offers, and you see your community, the violence is going to skyrocket to the sky. God appointed a hero, a warrior, to this neighborhood, a mother to this neighborhood. To me, that's Miss Clemy and I, because she's like my mom, because I lost my mom going to him tomorrow for the fifth day, fifth year. Her son got murdered, and I became her son. I came back into her life. I ain't seen her in 20 years, and she didn't recognize it, but she was the type of woman that breathed positive in my brain and in my head in a negative situation. Well, I'm ready to take a torch. Everything these kids see is negative. I'm a positive thing to come out of this neighborhood, and I'm living proof what impossible can turn to impossible. By the help of y'all, we can help this happen because I've turned down, and we go over my eyes, I'm sorry, I've turned down many jobs because I know this is my calling. What kid, what kid don't want to look up and see the guy that was on TV who got Gordon Ramsay to love him and to turn his jobs down just to be with them? I'm that guy. You look at my record, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm kind of proud of it because it made me the man I am today. How many kids from these projects can actually say they grew up to be somebody who broke the circle? The first one to go to college, the first one to leave, the first one who leaped out on faith. You're looking at this guy. The guy who was on drugs, who used to rob, who's overturned all that. You're looking at this guy. If people don't believe in God, that's on them. I give you my testimony to show you living proof of what a man can do once he changes his life. Of course you go down, everybody's been down a wrong road. I'm not here to judge no kid, but I give them the vision of a road they can go down and they can live at, or they can look at me by example and lead, let me plant a seed, and Miss Clement plant a seed in their heart to show them what success can be. Everybody's always talking about telling a kid how to be successful, but I'm showing them what success looks like. Here I am. I'm asking them begging for an opportunity. As you can see, I, I talk with a smile because I'm confident in what God put in me put in us to do. All I want is, all we want is an opportunity. A lot of people who come, who do these events and talk, I see it firsthand, but how many actually spent the night in them kids' shoes? I have. I know what it's like, but I also know how to know what it's like to overcome it. And to be able to teach these kids, it would be not only a blessing to me, but I know it'll make my mom happy in heaven. I promise y'all, I was not coming to this meeting. Because I was so depressed, so depressed, because of my heart. My fifth year anniversary of my mom's death, and I love my mom. She my everything. I know that devil was in my head to keep out of me. God got me out of my bed, man, and I flew down here less than 15 minutes. I'll show you the racket on the phone. I'm here for a reason. If these doors don't open, some other door will, but I know these doors are going to open for a reason today. And I just want to say thank you. I'm not going to cry. I'm, I, we got this. That's okay. We Our faces leave uh, a lot. I just National know, like, we here for a purpose. I know my purpose. And it, I, money is not going to make me happy. Me helping these kids is going to make me feel with joy. That's all I ask. Just, just give me a chance to help these kids and let the results speak for itself. So with that said, I mean, w the program is lined out really, really well in the, um, in the grant narrative. So I don't want to spend, a, didn't want to spend a lot of time on that. And I figured you probably would have some questions that we can address. Um, so since you, you, you feel Sterling's heart, and that is for us with our program directors, it's the heart. 
It's the heart that leads these kids. It's the heart that breaks down the barriers because these kids have walls. Their walls have walls. And um, it's, it's, it's in, in encountering someone who cares and has a heart like Sterling that di a difference is made. So what does that take? We need, we need the grant money. We need some seed money. And our budget is really simple. It's a simple program. We're going to teach these kids to cook. We're going to converse with them while they cook. We're going to engage with them on, about what's going on in their world as we cook. Food is like, it's the, the universal uniter. And so what do we need? We need a chef, we need a kitchen, we need some food, and we need transportation because we have got kids, y'all have got kids, and we're ready for the kids. We are a grassroots organization, Nashville Peacemakers, we have got the loaves and fishes things da thing down. Um, but we need the requested $5,000 so that we can buy some bread and fish to teach these young men how to cook and how to look at food in a whole different way, as an opportunity, as a springboard, as a future, and not just something that you shovel in on the daily. Um, and this program is, is seed for a much, much bigger vision within Nashville Peacemakers, a food truck, a, a Nashville Peacemakers food truck called The Spot, but that's for another day and a different grant. So that pretty much concludes our presentation and any questions you may have. Okay, now the, the 12 boys would be coming from referrals from juvenile court. Is that, where, where would the 12 they, they, be coming from? Say, same referrals as mm -hmm. our other programs, which come through juvenile, mm -hmm. um, which come through Metro Nashville Public Schools um, uh, social workers. Uh, MDHA is asking us, do you have, our kids programs are full right now. They're constantly wanting us to send us some kids. And we don't have anything right now to take their kids. And then, of course, through the justice system, because we want to get the kids that maybe have got a strike, but they also have a future. They still have a future just because they made a mistake. We look at a life, a mistake is a life lesson and not a life sentence. And so, yes, th through those three, three, uh, also, and then of course okay. also through through referral, word of mouth referral within the community. Okay, community referrals as mm -hmm. well as referrals from a juvenile court. Correct. Now, where will uh, Mr. Wright be teaching these classes? Well, there's several places, but it haven't been point yet. There's so many kitchens opportunity, but we haven't landed in one spot. Okay. But it lists the different ones that we're, uh, we're, yeah, we're it's, a, it's, it's a Christian, it's a knowledge academy. Then you got the one on uh, Nose and Road churches off of the bar, the Dennis Bar the facility. So this is a non-profit. I got daily dishes. My chef mentor, he's willing to let me borrow his kitchen to, to teach the kids. It's, it was going to be on a Saturday, which is I just, but it will be one central location. Yes, ma'am. So you're not going to be moving around. You no, ma'am. Once okay, we find one location, okay. yes, ma'am. Yeah, moving around would be too confusing. Mm -hmm. Too hard, and it's hard, and if, especially if you got some parents that are willing to drop the kids. I just know my saying on this is like cooking changed my life. I know I can't save everyone, but it's one going to be out there group that's going to make. It's, it's going to be nice to hear. Thanks to Nashville Peacemaker, thanks to everybody. Y'all changed my life. And I won't, can't wait till I get old. I hope I'm in a wheelchair and I hope I'm slobbing. And a kid come up to me just telling me that like, you changed my life. It's all I dream to hear. How many weeks will you work with these? Uh, it's going to be uh, one day a week. Hopefully, more. I want to go no more than three, but I know at least one day a week. 
we know what we're going to be doing. Our, I, our, our budget is currently structured for one day a week for 12 weeks with 12 boys. For two hours. For two hours. Mm -hmm. And the two hours does not include the transportation time. Um, with many of our programs, until the parents get bought in to what we're doing, they're not really interested in picking up and dropping off their kids. And that's okay. But what is wonderful is when you see that parent say, you know what, I see y'all bringing all these other kids, I can bring my child, I can pick my child up. That means that the parents are seeing a difference in that child. And where we used to, with back to basics, picked up all 10 of the girls, I pick up two now the two new ones, because the parents are all really, really into the program and seeing the results in their kids. So who will be providing the transportation? Um, our current, current tra our driver is okay. um, Centoria Franklin. She also drives for Lyft and for Uber. Um, she is on our Nashville Peacemakers insurance policy, and she currently drives also for um, Back to Basics as needed. And she is, has been fully background checked. Five remaining minutes. And she also has two daughters in the Back to Basics program. Uh, to throw a little leeway, like, uh, it's like on my part, the one thing that make me feel really happy with these kids coming to this program, they get to see the only man in the history of the show that Chef Ramsey ever actually loved. I'm the only one at that time, the only male to keep my jacket. That speaks volumes. You never heard of Chef Ramsey talking nice to anybody. And to be the guy that Chef Ramsey loved and can bring some other Hell's Kitchen contestants in front of these kids who's been down trouble roads to show them like, hey, you can be whoever you want to be and let that impact sink in. Ain't too many kids got that. And I would love to have the opportunity, we would love to have the opportunity to make this happen for some kids. I promise you, you know, this would not be something you regret. You probably gonna be like, I wanna prove that. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you all for your for your time. I would I would like to hug. I'm sorry. I'm a hug. <laughs> Is it okay if I hug y'all? Is it possible? Yes. No. Maybe so. It's okay with me. That's what's up. I got one out of Thank four. You. <laughs> I got Thank you. Thank you. Two out of four. Cindy, tell me I said hello. I will. Thank you so much.